Great. Well, thank you all for coming to the second Climate Change and National Security Forum. I'm Caitlin Worrell. I'm the co-founder and president of the Center for Climate and Security. And I'd like to start by thanking all of those who made this event possible. Uh, Representative Don Bacon, Carol Werner and her team at EESI, Laura Glitzen of the H.M. Jackson Foundation, Lucas Haynes, Heather Masser with our team, and our distinguished panelists from the Center for Climate and Security. Uh, the theme for today's forum is a responsibility to prepare. A responsibility to prepare is predicated on the fact that we are facing unprecedented risks, and we also have an unprecedented ability to anticipate those risks and to act accordingly. So the discussion and the reports being released today explore both those risks and the opportunities. First, we have distinguished military and national security leaders that will discuss the unprecedented risks to homeland, national, and international security posed by climate change. Second, we will explore the tools and capabilities for assessing, anticipating, and responding to those risks. Now, a lot of progress has been made on this front across both Republican and Democratic administrations and Congresses, but there remain key gaps to be filled. And that is basically what we're here to talk about today. So without further ado, I'll hand the floor over to Carol Werner, the Executive Director of the Environment and Energy Study Institute. Thank you. I'm Carol Werner, uh, Executive Director of EESI, the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. I too want to thank you all for coming this morning. We are delighted to see you. And I want to say how greatly we appreciate the partnership with the uh, Climate and National Security Forum and working with the uh, Center for Climate and Security. And this topic is an area which we believe is extremely important. And in fact, resilience and climate is a major theme for all of the work that we are doing at EESI. Uh, it goes through a lot of the work that we started last year as well as work this year. And in terms of looking at what that means, a lot of this also comes from the fact that we were started over 30 years ago by a bipartisan congressional caucus that was concerned about providing more solid, credible, timely information to policymakers and to their staffs about energy and environmental issues and how we could learn more and also seek out common sense solutions that recognized how important a healthy economy and a healthy environment are to our security. So I want to add my thanks to, because this briefing and this whole series of briefings and this partnership would not be possible without the support of the Henry M. Jackson Foundation and the David Rockefeller Fund. And so thank you very, very much to our funders so that we can help move this important work forward. Heather? Thank you, Carol. And um, I'll make this short since I'm the third person welcoming you here today. Um, thank you guys for coming. Um, what we're going to do is we'll have a first panel that asks, um, kind of frames the big question, what are the effects of climate on national security? Um, and then the second panel will help you guys think through um, a report that we've put out with uh, recommendations on what various gov U.S. government agencies and um, even uh, how Congress can be engaged in, um, you know, in, in providing for uh, better policy in these areas. Um, and I will forego long uh, bios for everyone. Um, I think. Uh, our, our moderator can touch on the experience of the group if he would like, but um, we have an extremely diverse panel um, in terms of backgrounds, in terms of perspectives and disciplines, um, in the ways that they look at um, the effects of climate on national security. Um, if you look at the bios in, in, your, um, in your agenda, you'll see um, you know, they come with probably potentially two centuries worth of experience in this area. Um, all together, of course. Um, <laughs> not any one of you, I promise. Um, but you know, we have um, you know we have folks from almost from every service, um, and we have folks who've dealt with readiness and ranges. We have um, people who've been ship drivers, and we are very lucky to have um, these these um, distinguished folks on our board to advise us in um, you know finding practical policy solutions um, for these challenges. So. Um, without further ado, I have, I will give you the panel. 
So good morning, everybody. I'm John Conger. I'm going to moderate the panel this morning. I'm a senior... Mike? Oh. Funny story. Um, I did that the first time I testified at a hearing, and the, the members of Congress were all very helpful to say you have to push the button. So, okay. Um, the, uh, yes, the learning curve. That's right. Uh, so in any case, um, my name is John Conger. I'm going to be moderating the panel today. I'm a senior policy advisor at the Center for Climate and Security. And uh, I have, I, I spent uh, the better part of the last, well, the, the, in the last administration in the Pentagon wor working these issues uh, in, in a variety of roles, most recently the Acting Assistant Secretary of Defense for Energy Installations and Environment. We put out the climate change strategy and such. For that, I uh, had a bunch of time on the Hill. I'm going <clears> to <throat> uh, frame the issue here a little bit and ask some of the questions. Um, and, and I want to do a brief introduction so you know who's up here. So as Heather said, the, the framing question for today is how does uh, climate change affect national security? This is a fairly broad topic. Um, I think of it in DOD terms m m more specifically, uh, sort of how does it affect your mission today? How is it going to affect the set of missions you're going to have to deal with tomorrow? And, and then how does it affect the geopolitical situation? Uh, there are DOD strategies that talk about it being a threat multiplier, and that's very real and present in stuff that, that DOD um, works to understand. Uh, each of our panelists are going to be able to tell stories from their own experience uh, that's, that fills in each of those areas and, and talks, to, talks to each specific. But today, uh, we're I wanted to use props. So I have here uh, our second edition uh, sea level rise report from the Center of Climate Security. Um, we're issuing this today. You're going to be able to find it on our website. Um, and the, the folks up here each contributed to this report. So that's why we, we chose who we chose. We have folks from each service uh, represented, and, uh, and they each have their own expertise that they're bringing to the table. In brief, because I'm not going to read their bios, otherwise I'd, I'd filibuster the whole time. Um, but, uh, but in brief, we've got, and I'm going to do all the intros up front, and then I'm going to hand it to the panelists to talk. Uh, General uh, Jerry Galloway, uh, Army, retired. Um, most recent uh, position was dean at West Point. He had a long uh, career in the Corps of Engineers and is basically like the water expert, if you have water questions. Um, we have uh, Admiral Jonathan White. Uh, he was most recently oceanographer of the Navy. Uh, General Ron Keyes uh, finished up his career as commander of Air Combat Command. Uh, Vice Admiral Robert Parker uh, from the Coast Guard. Uh, he was commander of the Coast Guard's Atlantic region. Uh, and then uh, at the end, we have Joan Vandervoort. She was uh, in OSD, and I worked with Joan frequently uh, when, I was, when I was in the Pentagon. Uh, she was most recently deputy director for Ranges, Sea, and Airspace, and is going to talk a bit about readiness. So with that introduction... Uh, you don't need to hear me speak much longer. I'm going to turn it over to General Galloway to start. Uh, a few weeks. There we go. A few weeks ago, I was at a civilian community asked to come in and talk about climate change and national security. And the question was, we don't understand. What's the relationship between the two? And I said, you may not understand, but uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines all understand because they live with weather and terrain every day. It's the heart of the military profession. You have to know what it is, and it affects national strategy and the way you operate. It can influence where we fight, who we fight. It can dictate on what terrain we fight and what that terrain's going to look like and how we're going to fight in that kind of terrain. It defines a type of equipment that we will need. And as that changes over time, we have to keep up with it. And it impacts the readiness of hundreds of our military installations here in the United States and abroad. We've got to stay on top of uh, what those installations are doing and ensure that they're ready for the future. Let me give you a few examples. Where will conflicts originate? Oh, we, we can look at the map and we can see lots of things, but one thing we can see where there is stress caused by climate change. The lack of water, the lack of food driven by climate change, uh, the millions of the poorest who are subject to these sorts of uh, stresses, uh, they put these poorest into motion, into things like migration uh, and instability. We see uprisings in countries. It's the fertile ground for people like Al-Qaeda and ISIS to, to work. It just leaves people worrying about their future and the future of these countries. Those are the places where we would expect to see 
catalyst for conflict. This climate change is creating the pressures that may bring us into uh, warfare. It may bring us into needs to support our allies and partners. It may change the way we do things as time progresses. Uh, look at what has happened in Syria and in other places in the world as a result of uh, droughts. Syria, people moved in off the farms. The droughts and the, the unavailability of wheat uh, moved people into the cities, and they didn't have jobs, and it created the instabilities that we've already seen there. Uh, what's going to happen in Cape Town if they run out of water? Uh, though, I mean, that's an amazing thing. And, and what will that do in a tinderbox? Read the paper Sunday, and you can see the challenges that exist there. Significant increases in major storms, we see that. Uh, I'm a, a flood guy. I'm working in Houston and Texas right now. Let me tell you, 64 inches of rain is a lot of rain. And put that on, in the context of if you put that on a battlefield, what it would mean. Uh, major storms and rainfall events would turn a normally passable battlefield into mud pits and would stop everything. You can look at history and see the number of times that warfare has stopped with the equipment they had then. And even with our modern equipment, nature takes a, a lead in many things. You can't cross a river when it's at, at flood stage. You can't move through areas that are literally impassable because of mud. Increased temperature has already uh, influenced the ability of our aircraft to fly. I think you all recall from the civilian standpoint that they had to shut down aircraft at Sky Harbor in Phoenix because of hot temperatures. What's going to happen as these temperatures increase, and we know they are, what's going to happen on the battlefield when we can't carry the loads that we used to carry? Well, the answer is we need to think about what that's going to mean for us in terms of equipment development. It says that the same temperatures are going to be debilitating to our forces. Uh, and how do we operate there? You can say, well, we'll get through it, but you can't. Uh, we know what happens. You go back and look at the uh, heat waves in Europe over the past decade, and you see that we're not talking about tens of people. We're talking about thousands of people dying from heat. And when you put soldiers carrying large packs or Marines carrying large packs, people on ships moving across areas that are uh, where the weather has gotten to be so terrible, it's very difficult for them to operate. We've got to think about those things, and that's going to influence our national security. Uh, daily temperatures, rainfall, drought driven by climate change, fires will place the uh, demands on the military equipment that we haven't seen before. So what are we going to do about it? That means it takes 5, 20, maybe 40 years to get to a new weapon system. Look at how long it's taken us to get to several of the systems that we're still developing today. We need to think about what is that temperature requirement? What are the other requirements there, environmental, that are going to be there for that equipment? Are we going to be able to supply our logistics? Will we get our water there under, under conditions of climate change? Those things affect our ability to be on the battlefield and to be effective. Uh, these new weapon systems will need uh, to be carefully evaluated. Our supply chains, we've gone to this just-in-time logistics, which is wonderful. I get everything there just in time. But if, if the road is cut, the Mississippi River shut down transcontinental uh, traffic in 1993 with that flood. There were lots of places in the Midwest and in the Texas that were shut down during the, the big floods that you saw last fall. Those things happen overseas. The Indus River, when it rises out of its banks, it moves. The same thing can be said for other areas where we have potential battlefield challenges. So we need to be ready for that. The other thing is uh, the issue of our installations. We have installations all around the world that belong to us, belong to our allies, and those that we share. And they are subject to such things as sea level rise, increased storms. Uh, we can see that the hurricanes that have co come through recently have made major impacts on these installations. Uh, the fires have been very important. Uh, you can see pictures, uh, if you picked up the newspaper, of fires just outside Camp Pendleton in uh, California. Those fires shut down the ranges. They endanger our troops that are out there. But they can also occur on the battlefield. If you want to go back in history, go to the wilderness and see the challenges that took place during that battle just outside of, uh, just north of Richmond, when the, the woods caught fire and the soldiers were there. So we've got to know and understand that and be ready to deal with these things. This requires risk identification at each and every one of our bases, here and overseas. It may be an island in the Pacific we use to store goods. It might be uh, the Kwajalein complex where we use and, and work on missiles and use that as a, a training ground and a, a testing ground. We've got to be ready to see what's going to happen over time and have addressed that 
and started the process that in this particular building uh, begins of getting money ready. You can't just go in and ask for a uh, million dollars for next year. It goes through a long process and you have to rack and stack these over time to ensure that you're ready and you are properly dealing with this particular issue. Uh, we know that we have these challenges in our installations. I compliment the Department of Defense for setting out to find out what they really are. And they've made the initial sweep through to identify what they uh, have out there. What's interesting is a survey that was completed recently uh, by the DOD. Uh, about 50% of the people out there said, yep, we can see it already. And you'll hear from my colleagues some of the challenges that exist at the bases that are on the East Coast. And in our report, we talk about uh, that. Uh, what is there out there? I was at uh, Hilton Head and talking to them about Paris Island. They're worried about that. Those are their neighbors. And, and when they can't get to the ranges, when they can't move the troops around, that's a problem for us. And when you can't get to the uh, ports to send the troops overseas, that's a problem for us. Uh, we expect, you expect, the military to be ready for anything. Uh, we think that it's important to understand that climate change is going to cause big bumps. And as this report says, the military has a responsibility to prepare, and they have to be ready for climate change. And I'll stop there. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Um, next, we're going to hear from Admiral White and get a little bit of a Navy perspective. Thanks, John. So if I seem a little stressed up here, it's because I'm sitting next to one guy who used to sign my fitness report, or, or that's a performance evaluation. Another guy who used to sign it is in the back of the room, uh, and he'll be on the next panel. So one thing you, I think we all know is that it doesn't matter how senior you get, your former bosses are always happy to provide you with feedback on how you did things wrong. So, um, so I am an oceanographer. Uh, I'm currently the president and CEO of the Consortium for Ocean Leadership. It's an ocean science organization, a consortium of about 100 institutions, industry, academic ocean science, and it's all around ocean. So sea level rise is sort of what we deal with in everything that happens to the ocean and how the ocean impacts climate overall. The first thing I just want to say, and did this a lot in the Pentagon working with several folks, is understanding that the climate change impacts on a maritime nation, and we are a maritime nation, arguably the largest maritime nation with the largest amount of EEZ. France doesn't think so, but, you know, it's just an argument about a few thousand square miles. So we, and as a maritime nation, we need to understand that the geostrategic landscape is changing, and that's one of the upfront things you'll find in, in this report. Well, okay, that's really profound. The geostrategic st st landscape is always changing. Politics are changing, leaders are changing, nations are changing borders, things come and things go. We spend a lot of, we invest a lot of resources in understanding how the geostrategic landscape is changing. My question is, have we focused enough resources and are we really getting to understanding how the geostrategic landscape is changing in terms of the impacts of climate change on that? And that will come to my end remark as well. So think about that. How is climate change really impacted and what are we doing to understand it? We talk about coastal geography, sea level rise, changing coastlines, the infrastructure. I was just down in Miami a couple of weeks ago visiting the University of Miami, one of our members. You sort of forget about Irma and what happened to the Middle Keys. It went right over as a Category 4 hurricane. Oh, there's a little naval air station down there in Boca Chica known as NAS Key West. And if you go to the Commander Navy Installations website, it says, I quote, uh, it's got perfect flying weather year round. <laughs> well, except for maybe in the middle of that Cat 4 hurricane, but that's just one day, right? No. So we think about the future of Key West, as talked about in there, and you start to look at the impact. The impact on some of our coastal bases, but that one, and there's a picture of it, I think, on the front of the report. As well, think of 2050, 2070. 2070, likely high tide every day is going to result in about at least half of the land as we know it in NES Key West now being flooded, very likely given all the uncertainties that are in there, we'll see, but we have to plan for that. So think about that's one base, and you look at the keys and the hazardous weather and the events and everything, uh, it's certainly those type of bases are to be looked at. So there's the infrastructure. Then there's the Arctic. Oh, by the way, China just put a paper out as part of their uh, maritime belt strategy, and they basically talk about the, the polar silk road. Do we have a silk road? What's, you know, that's part of our road to get up there. We think about what's happening in the Arctic, and the Arctic, as we know, is changing. The impact on the Arctic, it's not just that it's going to be, you know, water and, and things like that. What's going to happen to commerce, to traffic, to industry, and to our competitors? Are we looking at an Arctic that is as, as controversial as the South China Sea? I don't know, in 30 years. Something to think about. 
we think about the basic needs and the impacts on leadership and geostrategical issues that uh, you know my cohorts have and we'll, we'll talk about, but I get back to the ocean pieces and the importance of climate change on the ocean and looking at food security, water security, as was mentioned by General, General Galloway, and, and, and these issues, how is that going to change the risk of conflict, as he talked about? I want to, I want to re really emphasize that. As we see food sources and compound climate change changing in ocean chemistry, ocean biology, sea level rise with overfishing, what's happening there, growing populations in coastal areas that are highly poverty. What's going to happen? How does that lead? Does that lead to a conflict type of scenarios around the world that we don't even understand today? We need to understand that. That gets back to the how question. So in the really impact that we're starting to see, we need to understand is the impact on the resources. So everybody is great, you know, we've got a budget passed, the DOD is getting a lot of money, they're building, going to build ships in the Navy, probably. And by, by the way, from a Navy Coast Guard pr perspective, you know, we, we like that ma ma maritime piece. You know, we talk about planet Earth, and I focused on ocean because apparently the Army guys named the planet. Because if it had been Coast Guard and Navy, it'd be planet ocean. I mean, the Air Force have been planet air and space, but, <laughs> but it is, but it really is planet ocean with, with 71%. What resources are we in the Navy, what resources are we on DOD really applying to understanding the how and the resource impacts of getting after this? We certainly need to invest in more research on what's happening to our climate, what is happening to our ocean, what is going to happen to our coastlines, uh, and taking that and assessing the risk based on the understanding of the science. We have to invest in science. We have a military that has always been invested and founded on scientific principles. It's key to our future, and we need to understand that, but the military can't do it alone. But I ask, is our military, is our Department of Defense, is their voice loud enough to influence our federal investment in the science that will help us understand the impacts going forward? And that gets to, to the how question of understanding that geostrategic landscape for the future, and then what do we do about, about it, which is what the next panel is going to talk about. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, so, so far we've heard a lot about geopolitical uh, implications. We've heard uh, a lot about how it's going to, how climate is affecting operations on the battlefield today, how it can affect our installations. And then uh, Ad Admiral White talked about a little bit about uh, the Arctic as well. Uh, next, we're going to hear from uh, General Keyes, uh, who also, you know, as he was commander of ACC, the Air Combat Command, he also commanded one of the bases that's going to be most impacted uh, or is being impacted even today by climate change. I suspect he's going to talk a little bit about Langley. Uh, General? You hope. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd just like to go back. I mean, I, I could easily say me too and then and pass the microphone. Uh, I mean, there we've covered a lot. Uh, basically, it's a matter of, uh, of planning. It's a kind of two-part science and then one part What's practical, affordable, and doable in time? That's what we, that's what we really have to uh, get to. Uh, the first part of the science is, in, in the report, is the, sea, the effects of sea level rise. I mean, that's a, that's a fairly understood science. If you tell me, if I were a hydrology engineer, if you tell me the sea level is going to rise six inches, I can, I can roll that out on a, on a coastal base, and I can tell you to a... A technical term to a gnat's ass where that water is, is going to rise to. I mean, it's, it, it, that is all math. Uh, on the other hand, if you tell me the sea level is going to rise six inches, then people might argue, is it going to rise six inches, is it going to rise a foot, is it going to rise three feet? I think we pretty much agree that it's going to rise some level. So what we have to work through now is, well, how soon and how high and then what can you do? And there are really two, dish, uh, two issues. One is the, the direct effect on bases. You've got a, it's any, any fort, port, base, it's just like a little village or city or town. And what I have to be able to do is I have to be able to live there, I have to be able to train there, I have to be able to test there, have to mobilize, have to deploy. And in many cases, particularly for the Air Force, I've got to reach back. If I'm flying my RPVs, I'm flying them remotely. If I'm doing my intelligence analysis, I'm doing it remotely, back here. And so we tend to think sometimes about uh, climate change as, oh, the, the, the global aspects. And there are global aspects, but there are direct effects on where we're based. We've got some 95,000 uh, miles of uh, coastline, 
and uh, some, some, something south of 2,000 bases uh, that could be, effect, uh, could be affected. So we need to look at it and say, what, what will it look like? And then the other part of it is the indirect effect. It's more business. If I'm going to have to go out and do firefighting, if I have to do swift water rescue, if I am doing recon on disasters, humanitarian relief, that means I'm going to have to have more training. You can't put people out on a fire line if you haven't trained to be on a fire line. You can't do swift water rescue unless you've learned to do swift water rescue or we're getting everybody swept away. And that may mean that I need different gear. And so I've got to make a plan for do I need different gear? Can I adapt the gear I have? How much money is that going to cost? How much training time is that going to take? Because that takes away from the original job that you all hired us to do, which is go and fight and win America's wars when we're called upon to do so, whether that's global vigilance, humanitarian uh, rescue, or actual combat. So there's, we've got to make those, tr uh, make those trades. It forces us to make those trades. And that's sort of a part of what I call the fragile, the failing, and the feckless states over there, that this is going to get real bad uh, real quick. When they run out of water, they run out of food, we get ungoverned spaces, and the crazies start fil filtering in there to build their own uh, spaces. So I think that's an important thing. So the approach has got to be, well, how bad could it be? And could we stand that? Because we in the military have a term that's called survive to operate. That means we know we're going to be attacked but we have got to be able to fight through the attack and continue to, to operate. So you look at how bad could it be? In some cases, I'm not going to put a lot of money in it because I'll stand on one leg and grip my teeth until it's over, and then I'll go on with my, uh, go on with my life. In other cases, I find out I couldn't stand that. So then the next question i got to ask is, what could, we, what could we do? Can I put up a berm? Uh, can I put pumps? Can I change where I've cited some of my uh, uh, business? Because this is not about a tidal wave uh, 30 feet high sweeping across a base. This is about water coming in uh, every day. You have two high tides uh, in a 24-hour period, and uh, we call that nuisance flooding. But the nuisance flooding, when it gets to a certain area, you go, it's not nuisance flooding because my people can't park in the parking lot anymore because when high tide comes, it seeps in their, the doors of their car. They can't get to work in some, uh, in some cases. So what can we do to change that? And then how long will that take, and how much will it cost? And then what if we're wrong? And how will we know we're wrong? Are we not building enough, or are we building more than we really need to? Because once again, money doesn't grow on trees. We've got a limited amount of money, and you're going to have to balance against all the threats, the threats that, you're gonna, you're, that we call adversaries. And now, as it turns out, Mother Nature may in fact be one of our uh, adversaries, so you have to balance that, balance that sort of uh, risk. Uh, I was stationed at Langley Air Force Base twice, uh, once in the uh, early 80s, and uh, flying uh, F-15s, and we had, during that time, we had a number of hurricanes move through there, and so long about September, when you're finishing your flying hours out, uh, we'd have to fly to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio because the hurricane's coming through and you don't want your birds sitting on the, the ramp when that, that happens. But we didn't get a lot of damage. We got a little bit of wind damage, but not much because the base was built to withstand what? Hurricanes. We're smart enough to figure that out. The other problem that we have is we had a little bit of flooding because it, as you, uh, when you set your altimeter to take off, you set it at seven feet. So you're not that high out off the water to begin with. Then I came back in 2005 uh, as commander of Air Combat Command, same base. We didn't have any big uh, hurricanes go rolling through there, but we had se several nor'easters come through. And wouldn't you know it, the nor'easter hits at the absolute wrong time. It hits at high tide. It hits <clears throat> at, at the proper angle so the winds could come sweeping in that bay. And we had about three feet of water in the, the uh, road outside of my uh, quarters there. on bay. We had not had that sort of problem before. Then we had another one. Then we had another huge push of uh, water. And we have, you know, we have done things that we thought were prudent, but it turns out we need to do more. It, so those are the kinds of threats that you, you face. And 
that I have, and I've seen the change from way back when the hurricane would hit and was an irritant, but it wasn't that bad, to the point that now you're just getting a plain old vanilla nor'easter, and it gets pretty, pretty painful because it's not just a matter of, of, again, a tidal wave coming across your base and knocking things down. It's getting into the electrical conduits that we buried because why? Because we didn't want the hurricanes knocking the poles down. You get uh, water backing up into some of your backup generator areas because why? There are nice big concrete block houses uh, built fairly low to withstand winds, but now we've got water seeping into them. So it's all of the, that. Then you start looking at your wells around the base, and you're starting to see salt water in training into your freshwater uh, uh, wells. So those are the kinds of things that we just have got to look at and make investments based not on historically what happened, but in the future what may happen. We And that's hard. It's hard for all of us to look at what's, what's the worth, the future worth of a present investment. You know, if we could get our heads around that, we'd all be millionaires on the stock market if we could figure that out. And now we've got to spend money against a risk that we're pretty sure it's coming, but it's not 100 percent. But we in the military look at it, and if you wait till it's 100 percent, then you're in a situation where one of my favorite uh, lines, you know, if you wait till you're ass deep to a tall shrimper in water before you start worrying about sea level rise, you're way behind the curve at that point. We can't allow that to happen. We have got to start making it. So it's a matter of how bad could, be, could it be? Could we stand it? If we can't, what can we do? How long will it take? How much will it cost? And then what if we're wrong? If you, all of us, I think all of us in here lived through the uh, mortgage meltdown in 2008. And a, and a great part of that problem was what? The default rates were based on historical default rates. It didn't take into, into account what the situation was today and what the situation was going to be in about three, or three to five years when all the teaser rates came due and, and jacked up. Uh, we can't afford to do that in, in this situ in this situation here with climate and sea level rise. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. And 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 I think I want to I want to sort of pull one thread that the general mentioned is DoD self insures. So when something goes wrong, we can't rely on somebody else to come and bail us out. We have to prepare for that contingency and. You know, you, you know as well as I do that DOD is a contingency operation. We don't want to have to fight a war. We prepare for it. And so it, with climate co uh, change coming and, these, and the sea level rising, we have to basically take that into account as we make our investments going forward. You don't want to build your new building where it's going to be flooded out in, in 10 years. You don't want to do that. It doesn't make sense. And so it's about prudently investing your resources in the future, not just mitigating the, the ones that you've already spent. But you got to do some of that, too. OK, <clears throat> so next, we have Vice Admiral Robert Parker from the Coast Guard, retired. Um, and uh, I suspect you had a jurisdiction over a whole host of uh, 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 sea level impacted installations. We do, and thank you. And uh, good morning, and thanks for all of you for your attention and your interest in this topic. None of my bosses are in the room. My stress involves whether or not the dog has been out know, recently enough that we don't have to worry about that. Um, but I do worry about uh, how we're going about addressing you know, a changing climate, uh, and it's been a passionate topic for me for a while. Uh, I can also say me too, because whenever the the services mobilize uh, to fight, the Coast Guard's somewhere in the mix there, uh, been involved in every armed conflict since the forming of our nation. So uh, we depend on the DOD side to do that. So what's different about us uh, for those of us who wore the Coast Guard uniform? Well, a couple of things. One is we have both national security and homeland security issues to deal with. Uh, and when your work involves first responder type activities, both in the impacted zone and also where you happen to be based to support that effort, uh, it creates a slightly different mix. It doesn't seem like as big a deal until you realize that time is life. Uh, in a lot of the missions that we have, in addition to the one that we have to support DOD, we have 10 other statutory missions in the Coast Guard uh, that are all impacted by that uh, event. Moving commerce, safety of lives, uh, key among those. And when you have work that is a time sensitivity to it, that's on the water, uh, the, the planet ocean, as John said, 
uh, it's important that you're close enough to get to it because that proximity matters. It's a speed time distance problem for us. So we find that almost all of our facilities are in areas that are at some level of risk. So we're constantly balancing that risk as we go through. Uh, the Arctic challenges, as John mentioned, uh, are very much there. Uh, we're happy to partner with the Navy uh, in trying to sort out how we do that, who does that, how you resource that, uh, what it means. Infrastructure is extremely problematic in the Arctic uh, to begin with, and then with warming uh, and the, the erosion. You know when the natives who have lived there for thousands of years pick up and move their entire village? You've got to do something different than the way we think about things in the lower 48. Uh, so those challenges are real for us uh, in the Coast Guard and how we go about doing that. The other challenge that we have, and I'm happy to say the Coast Guard, if you look at the report and you look at the recommendations in there, is addressing all of those possible exception of the data issue at the bottom, which uh, I think everybody's still struggling with. Um, but it's, it's less of a focus area at the DHS departmental level. You might notice they've got some other distractions uh, between immigration and cyber and some other issues that are going on that are taking up the limited bandwidth that they do have. And they don't have the history as an organization to have the planning factors built in that would automatically include climate change. These are just things that are part of the mix as they go on. They're not as big of an issue uh, in, the, in the strategic documents. So why do I care about this? How did I come to be passionate about this? Um, as a ship driver, um, you, get, you get interested in weather. It affects everything you do. And when the weather goes bad more frequently and more severely, you begin to wonder if you're just in the wrong place or the wrong line of work. Um, I remember fairly vividly after about midway through my career when I was driving ships and I was on a ship based out of New Bedford uh, in Massachusetts and we were up off of New England. We're out on the egg line between the U.S. and Canada doing fisheries enforcement and the only news we could get at that time was via AM radio or via the teletype and uh, we knew there was a storm coming. We were planning for it. We we're trying to dodge it and I remember hearing very vividly a newscaster say, and this storm has passed safely out to sea. <laughs> that didn't make me feel any better at all. Um, so it matters where you are as to what impact you're going to get from these things. And then as I got to grow into my, uh, into my chops, as I got more senior in the service, uh, I was down at U.S. Southern Command, and I found that we were spending a lot more time doing humanitarian assistance work down in the Caribbean, specifically in Haiti. Uh, we did four relief efforts in Haiti before, in two years before we did the earthquake relief down there. I was uh, the J3 for that event. And then I left there and came up to the Atlantic area, and I noticed that, you know, it seemed like we were doing hurricane relief all the time. Um, and then I also noticed that we were, our, our headquarters bordered a street called Water Street, which was very aptly named because every time a storm rolled through or a nor'easter rolled through, it was underwater. And a Mini Cooper really doesn't do well, by the way, for those of you who drive that, when the water's three feet deep uh, on the street. So I got more and more interested in this as I went along. And then um, Superstorm Sandy hit. Our first, our first encounter with Sandy was down in Guantanamo Bay where we have forward operating base for our helicopters that base on and off of our ships. It's our forward logistics area down there. It's a wildly useful space for DHS. Um, direct hit right into the hangar. It had never had a, a Category 2 hit before. Um, wiped out the facility. We wound up re rebasing over on a place that had previously been wiped out and then rebuilt. Uh, over in Turks and Caicos in order to do all the support work we needed to do there. It did not have the logistics footprint we needed. We did not have everything else we needed to do that. That was complicating enough, but the storm also bent then straight up through the Bahamas and ripped through the Bahamas as a Category 4 before it came all the way up back to just a Category 1 uh, and then impacted the major news zone of the United States, which is kind of an interesting way to get attention on this. One of the things we learned during Sandy was some of your planning is based on the last big event you had. Just like the story about the mortgage, um, after 9-11, our folks in New York at the sector there moved all their strategic or their tactical communications off the towers because they were on Tower 1 at the World Trade Center uh, when the attack hit in 9-11. So where did they move it? And they put it in a nice safe place, which was underground at the South Battery. Yeah, it didn't do very well during Hurricane Sandy. So one net for the city was completely out. Uh, it was a very interesting place to visit when the lights are out below 72nd in all of lower Manhattan. Uh, it, was, it looked like something out of a science fiction movie. And working in that environment, trying to provide relief, trying to get gasoline to move again and 
stave off the people that wanted you to just park a barge and pump it over the side. Static electricity, by the way, very bad with gasoline. Um, so there's a lot of different challenges that you have when you have that much of our populace that lives, works, eats, sleeps, breathes in these impacted zones. So one of the things that happened in Sandy, and it's, it's in the report, um, and it doesn't seem like a huge base, but it's, it's, a, it's a key point, is Sandy Hook, New Jersey. It's right at the entrance where Ambrose Channel comes in. Uh, we had a fairly good tactical base there, pretty much wiped off the map. I wanted to put the fuel pier on a milk carton to see if anybody could go find it because it was just gone from the facility. Uh, but when we went there and visited, there was great angst to get back in and get operating again. And the timeline that was involved and the planning that, at that time that existed really told us to go ahead and rebuild where we were because all of the bases and things we have are so precious, you know, both from a from a operating standpoint and from a constituency standpoint, that it's just too hard to move off that marker to something else. It's easier to rebuild and move on because the press of the day wants you to do that. In hindsight, I don't think I'd make that decision. And the folks that I've talked to recently in the Coast Guard leadership are trying to get a more strategic look at this so that we don't strengthen something that sits in an increasingly vulnerable spot. They're throwing good money after bad. And when you look at it, the very example of the mortgage piece if you look at how the Coast Guard has had to invest, and it's a very small amount, you've got a $20 billion infrastructure capital there. Um, so you're looking at about a billion dollars recently that you put on top of it. That. That's a lot of money. And it's about twice the money that we've invested through direct planning. Um, and it's putting it back into areas that, frankly, if we had to do it from scratch, we wouldn't invest in. So I think we need a better strategic look at how we do that, have strategic options available to us. I'm happy to say the service is trying to do that. We need to do more of that across the way. The last thing, a point I'll make here, is when you look at how this is done, it's not just the services that are impacted. There's families associated with that, all the things that support that, the, the logistics to get, to, the care and feeding for the, for the people that are, that are based there and all of the community are very important, and they're equally impacted. So if you can't get a coordinating mechanism to get all those people thinking together, and it's state, local, tribal governments, tribal especially where I live out in Washington State, um, and then you get the you know federal government involved, and then you get the services involved. It's nice to have everybody in the room, and you'll probably hear this from Ann Phillips later. But somebody has to be in charge. Right now, there's not a good inf there's not a good overlay on top of that. That's a planning document um, that says who's in charge of what, who needs to do what, and be careful where we put that because if it's flooding, the natural place to put that is the Corps of Engineers, and I can tell you that their kit is already completely full, and then some. So maybe there's some other way we need to scratch that itch, but there's a, there's a piece there missing as we're looking at the oversight and authorization that we really need to look at, and that's how do we do this? What is the forcing mechanism to get these people to talk together, and how do we do it in a way that it's common enough between the different areas that the people that touch all those different areas don't have to learn 100 different ways of doing business? Thanks again for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Great. Thank you very much, Admiral. Um, last but not least, we have Joan Vandervoort. Uh, Joan uh, is a, a readiness expert, uh, and I think she's going to talk a little bit about how uh, sea level rise and other climate change effects are affecting how the military trains and tests uh, uh, on our ranges. And uh, Joan, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, John. Um, <clears throat> my passion for the last 15 years, both when I was with the Army as well as with the Office of the Secretary of Defense has been in training readiness. From the perspective of how can I protect that training readiness? Most of my focus has been on encroachment, um, encroachment from urban sprawl, from compliance with environmental regulations, um, and looking at lessening the restrictions and the challenges on the services when they train. See, our ability to be a ready force really depends upon our ability to train. Therefore, that requires us to have access to land, sea, and airspace assets. And particularly for land that has a carrying capacity to support that training, because we have large weapons platforms we have a large force that we have to train. So that's where our ability, we really depend on that land, sea, and airspace. And you know, the services have been challenged over the years with 
encroachment. Um, and they've been doing very well in meeting those challenges, but we still have restrictions on training and actually our testing missions as well. But you know what the game changer is? The game changer is climate change. And not just sea level rise, but all the different other climate change factors like drought, wildfire, higher temperatures. And so one of the words that I'm going to use is, is or a phrase is happening now. We don't have to wait 10 or 15 years or predict what's going to happen in the future because we are seeing the direct impact of climate change on our training right now. And let me give you a couple of examples. And these, um, mostly, uh, these are from the Army. Um, over the last five years, they've been seeing some unprecedented frequency of catastrophic events, impacts from climate change that are really happening to their training areas. Um, let's take, for example, um, 2015. Very serious and devastating rainfall events um, that impacted Fort Benning, Fort Jackson, and Fort Polk. At Fort Benning, over a three-month time period, they had two back-to-back um, severe weather, weather events, lots of rainfall. This caused over $14 million in damages and extensive damage to their multi-million dollar digital multi-purpose range, their Good Hope maneuver training area, and drop zones with significant impacts to their training. Now, let's look at encroachment what else was happening at that time. Because they had such significant damage and such massive erosion in the training area, we have a Clean Water, Water Act um, compliance issues. Because down at Fort Benning, they already have impaired waters. So we've compounded the problem there. At Fort Jackson, more than 15 inches of rain fell within a 24-hour period, washing out targets, roads, bridges, disrupting the unit training. And you have to remember that at Fort Jackson, it is one of our larger basic training installations. They had sustained training delays related as as they were waiting for those repairs to take place, but also lots and lots of erosion. Clean Water Act, um, Clean Water Act violations, um, and just compliance issues running into both cost and delays. And so we had some um, approximately $4.8 million in damages at Fort Jackson with 4.7 million at Fort Polk. So if you could see that we have to dig into our pockets to really take care of those expenses, and it's not just an expense, they're damages. And those repairs can't easily been, be made overnight. And the impact to the training land was tremendous was tremendous. Um, I was a training area um, program manager with the Army for quite a number of years. And I can tell you, sustainment of our maneuver training lands is, is key to training, because you cannot train um, ground, ground troops without the, a sustainable training land base. And the repairs need it to keep the capability up is tremendous there. Um, Fort Irwin, another really good example, 2014, after a three-year drought, they had a monsoon. It took out a um, brigade side live fire training complex. That is a tremendous impact. For that installation, over $50 million in damages. 
in Alaska, let's look at something other than um, rainfall events. Um, we had some rising temperatures um, that had caused extensive flooding in a maneuver training area and with the battle area complex, a Donnelly training area. Now, what happened there? We had an unusable maneuver training area and an inoperable battle area complex facility that we couldn't use for months. So think about the impact to training. You have lost training events, lost training days. Soldiers that are not getting trained. At Fort Wainwright, um, we had loss of the permafrost because of higher temperatures, which resulted in the maneuver training land with sinkholes, safety hazard, which affected um, airborne and mounted and dismounted training as well. So we not only lost training time, but we also had very high extensive damage and it cost a lot to repair that damage. And not to say it won't happen again. So those are kind of my examples, but we even have something like a Camp, Camp Pendleton. The Marine Corps' premier amphibious base out west, they're already challenged by escalating restrictions and limitations to training due to encroachment from urban development. 50% um, of their restrictions are due to threatened and endangered species as well as fire risk. Now, they have seen series um, after series of wildfires there, damages to the training area. Um, even when you have a risk of wildfire, it can limit your training. So limits on or um, you know, precluding training, live fire, pyrotechnics, explosives um, and in just between 2013 and 2015 nearly 53,000 acres burned at Camp Pendleton. Now from a land management aspect from training land when you have high intensity fires um, that are are burning that land you're also going to hurt that soil and that soil is going to be less receptive to rainfall and it won't be able to take it in as quickly. So you're compounding the problems there. Now just think about this. At Camp Pendleton, um, they can support up to 51,000 training events a year. And so when you're restricting and you're limiting training and you have risk of wildfire, and of course they are on, on the coast, and they are at risk to sea level rise, you're really hurting your training capability there. So the bottom line is that climate change is impacting training right now. We're not saying in five years or 10 years, but it is impacting training right now. And that access to our um, air and sea and land assets is so very important to our training capability and our national security. Thanks, Jim. So um, I'm just going to recap a little bit, and then I'm going to maybe ask a couple questions. I, I, I framed the discussion earlier as we're talking about how climate change affects national security is things that affect operations today. So you've got uh, operational impacts, you have impacts to our installations and to our infrastructure, and you have impacts, as you just uh, heard, to, to readiness and our training capability. We're going to have impacts tomorrow when to, to the sort of next generation of missions. We talked a little bit about the Arctic uh, and how as the ice melts up there, there is going to be more activity, the, the, how China has uh, plans to expand trade routes through the Arctic, how inevitably there will be more resource extraction. And, and as we think about resource extraction, inevitably we're going to be talking about conflicts. Um, and we talked a little bit about, frankly, fish as fishing as a resource extraction issue too, which is not 
uh, immune from conflicts by any stretch of the imagination, um, new storm patterns, uh, and so on. We talked a little bit about geopolitics as sort of a third category of, of impact, uh, how climate change can be a threat multiplier, and how water shortages and food shortages can really uh, light a tinderbox that is a weak state or a fragile state. Uh, th this is uh, fertile ground for terrorist organizations who are trying to recruit because when you have economic displacement, uh, you have folks who, who don't have uh, anything else to turn to and they are uh, more easily and more susceptible to, to those kinds of uh, uh, lures. So in that context, again, I'm, I'm repeating myself so you take it away, Th this is, this is Clear, it is clear that climate change has an impact on national security. We've heard a bunch of those pieces th through the conversation today. I am, I am going to remind you all that we have this report that we're releasing today on sea level rise and national security that each of these uh, experts contributed to. I, I, I want to invite, uh, I know we talked about several installations already, but as, as this report talks about many more than we've, we've touched on, if anybody wanted to bring up other examples that they have personal stories about where they have seen uh, this, the impacts of sea level rise on, on bases, uh, please jump in. Yes? Okay. All right, so one is uh, very close to here, the Naval Academy at uh, Annapolis, um, which if you look on the front of the other report that's out from the advisory group, there's a picture of the Air Force Chapel. The midshipmen don't want to be worshiping at the Air Force Chapel, I hear. I don't know, but uh, you look at that, and we've seen the impacts of sea level rise already. Uh, at the, the Naval Academy, they actually have um, have been working. They're putting plans in place. What would it take to change the infrastructure to ensure that the flooding that we've seen with Hurricane Isabel and other events at the U.S. Naval Academy, uh, that we actually do something to adapt to the change and we're able to keep our base there, or if not, at what point do you make a decision on moving it somewhere else? These are things that are going on right now, so I think that's one that is a really good example. We've also seen with our Naval Station in Norfolk, which was a pilot project actually in Tower Hampton Roads area, including Langley, including Army installations, and looked at all of it, and Coast Guard, of looking at what it is in the future. But I think when you look at the situation in Annapolis right there on the, the Severn River and the impacts and the, the Chesapeake with the winds and the storms the right way, as General Keyes talked about, that's one key example I think we in D.C. can focus because it's only an hour away. And you have a chance to see what's really going on there as a case study for how to get something right in the future. So that's one that really gets my attention. Anybody else want to touch on another example? If not, I um, you know I wanted I wanted to highlight a couple other points that got made. Um, Admiral Parker talked about how the Coast Guard has twenty billion dollars in infrastructure, and obviously that's largely on the coasts. Um, and while I, I couldn't tell you exactly how much of the DoD infrastructure is on the coasts, just so so we're clear, because I used to uh, sort of have oversight over it all, the the DoD currently values its infrastructure at one trillion dollars. So there is a lot there to be impacted and a lot of reinvestment that would be forced if you have to move missions uh, or at least mitigate against, against them. And, and, and frankly, that's, that's a key point too. We are unlikely to want to move bases when it costs billions and billions and billions of dollars to re relocate critical assets. Frankly, we have to figure out a way to adapt to those problems in place because we're not going to want to move those bases uh, if we can help it. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the geopolitics too, because frankly, this is this is it's an inescapable truth that uh, the climate change is a threat multiplier, that these issues cause conflicts overseas. I know uh, General Galloway uh, just participated in a CNA uh, panel. That I, I happen to be in the audience for, so I'm going to ask him to talk a little bit about this. I didn't prep him for this, but but he, since I've seen him talk about it already, can, can you talk a little bit about how water causes conflict uh, geopolitically? Uh, well, water is, water is certainly something that we can't live without. And, and the challenges that we face overseas is that uh, it's in short supply in the areas where the people are the poorest and where we are most likely to have the major stresses. 
uh, it is not just in the places we think about in deserts, but uh, you go to places like Cape Town, you go to places like Rio, you go to places like Manila, where there are hundreds of thousands of people who are living in poverty and don't have access to uh, water supplies. So as water stress grows, as the temperature grows, as drought increases, uh, what are they going to do about that? Uh, how do you provide that sort of resource to people um, who will then need jobs, have families to raise, and will look to the government to uh, deal with that? Uh, many of you may think back to uh, Bolivia many years ago, a decade, when uh, the Bolivian government decided they needed better water so they would contract out water to an American firm and let them run it. Uh, the riots of Cochabamba were our legend because they really nearly brought the government down and caused the, the new constitution of that state to say that water is a right and we've got to ensure that people have access to it. And that same thing appears in Southeast Asia where uh, we've, we're struggling over dams on the Mekong River. We see the Irrawaddy and the Salween in Myanmar uh, being developed. We see the conflict between water stress for hydropower. We want to have hydropower. At the same time, what do you want to do? You want to preserve fisheries that are feeding uh, millions of people. So you have to balance all of those things. And in, in the middle of this, the military sits and watches. And what I think what we're doing, and it is very useful, our military forces with their one-on-one uh, -on -one with their counterparts are helping them understand the challenges, how you identify the risk, what you can do about it, and what sorts of things we could help them do in moving forward, what uh, people like USAID and the State Department have with their programs to help overseas. But it is clearly a factor on every continent. It is something we have to worry about. And if we don't worry about it, it will be the, the catalyst for these conflicts. If it, even if it does not create the conflicts, it brings uh, poverty to its lowest level when you don't have uh, water. And so somebody has to worry about this. Our Congress, we have the uh, Paul Simon Act that came through that said we're going to help people overseas. We really have to be moving in this direction, and it's both a military and a social political issue that we have to address. Thanks, Jerry. Um, uh, you know, one, one of the issues in this context that concerns me an awful lot is how it conflates with nuclear security issues. And uh, the center's done some, some work on this. And, and you think to yourself, well, what does nuclear security and climate security have to do with each other? And it turns out an awful lot. Um, and, the, and the reason is, is that when climate instabilities like water shortages or water conflicts occur in nuclear states, and, they're, and you're basically feeding instability in a state with nuclear weapons or nuclear power, that creates a whole other dynamic of instability and crisis. And Pakistan is, is the one that, that worries me and sort of keeps me up at night. As you think about internal uh, stresses and conflicts in, inside Pakistan, and there are over water, and it's also a state with nuclear weapons, what happens if, for, if somehow uh, the tinderbox gets lit in, uh, over a climate issue uh, when you have other dynamics at play. So, so that's just one of those, one of those pieces that, that concerns me an, an awful lot. Can I, can I just add to that? The Indus River Treaty has been wonderful. It, it's, it's been an example of how those two countries have worked together for some period of time, but it's under stress right now. The Indians have a, a dam that's under construction. The Pakistanis don't like it. Uh, they're, they're not talking to each other as well as they could. Everybody is worried that this sort of thing is uh, that could bring them not necessarily immediately into head, head combat, but could uh, make things worse in places like Kashmir, which is in part of the, the, the fringes of the Indus. And so uh, we have to look at this across boundaries. The issue of transboundary water sharing is going to be uh, interesting, and it does affect nuclear powers. Yeah, and closer to home, I mean, we, we tend to say it's, it's all over there, but Georgia and Florida are, are in a suit uh, at this very moment because the folks and those of you who have visited uh, Florida and had the Apalachicola oysters, uh, that, that industry is up in arms because of the decreased flow coming down from Georgia is uh, making the bay too saline for the for the oysters. So there's a, I mean, this suit is probably going to be all the way to the Supreme Court on, this is water rights in our country. We think we're fairly, you know, erudite and uh, we, we can co cooperate and everything. But here is an, an example of right here in the, in the United States. As you go further west, particularly in the northwest, 
the uh, the fight between hydropower and the, and the fisheries and the wild rivers and everything like that. I mean, that is a real uh, issue, and and it's going to be a bigger issue as we start facing uh, climate change. Clearly, uh, that now you got to make a choice: Are you going to use a renewable, green, clean uh, fuel for your electrical grid, or are you going to? worry about the fisheries or are you going to worry about the pristine nature of being able to kayak down River X? I mean, those are those are going to be real, uh, and, and there's pluses and minuses, but what I think is the issue is, is, one of the big issues is we got to be able to sit down at the table and throw these issues on the table because the unspeakable will happen even if you don't speak about it. And we can't continue down the road where you can't say something because someone gets mad or someone says, no, that's not uh, correct. I mean, in the military, what we look at is this is not a big government, little government problem. This is not a liberal or conservative problem. This is not a Democratic or Republican problem. This is a problem that I've got a, a lily pad that I've got to operate from, and I need to keep it uh, whole. It's the same issue that we all have in our individual homes if we're in a flood plain, if we're in a hurricane zone. Uh, if we're in an area that's becoming drier and drier, we start to think about well, what can I do? How can I how can I maintain myself so I can live where I live, how I live, and continue to uh, prosper? Uh, that's a simple issue that the military is looking at, DOD uh, broadly. So I, I think those are. It's not just over there. And don't lull your. We don't want to lull ourselves into a. A uh, complacency because yeah, fine. It's a catalyst for conflict, but that's kind of what we're organized to do is conflict. We'd like to minimize the amount of conflict so we don't have too much business. But let's think about home because of the floods, our ability to transport things because of the lack of water, the ability to grow food, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it it is all works here. We don't see that quite as badly because we do tend to cooperate. We do tend to have. Uh, institutions that uh, that work together, but at some point, we're going to get to the point where there's going to be a rub. Uh, again, down at Langley, uh, there's a great uh, effort around Langley and uh, and Norfolk that when you're looking at maintaining the bases, you can't just maintain the bases because we got to get our food in, we got to get our fuel in, got to get our electricity in, got to get our people in, and there are places uh, there today where at certain tide levels, people can't get out of their area where they're living, as we say, on the economy. They can't get their car through the water. You know, and that start, should start to concern a lot of people because that workforce not only goes to the bases and the ports, but uh, you know, commercially all around. And so those are the, that's the leading indicator. We in the Air Force have this approach. We have leading and lagging indicators. We know, for example, on our airplanes, if we start having an increased amount of unscheduled maintenance, that means we're missing stuff on our uh, periodic inspections or something's breaking new in a wonderful new and novel way. And if we don't get onto that, the lagging indicator is the fully mission capable. That's going to be in the toilet at some point down the road if we don't get our handle on this. And so now we have these, we have these leading indicators where we're seeing uh, floodplains change. Uh, some of you may have gotten, you know, notes from your uh, insurance company said, "Oh, by the way, you may need flood insurance." Uh, we see that as those are those are the ba those are the leading edge indicators that if you don't do something now, it's going to be really bad uh, uh, down the road. You know that that's a there's a really good point uh, that the general just made that I don't want to get lost. Communities are indispensable to our bases, okay? The, the power comes from off base generally. Uh, there's some backup capability, but the fact of the matter is is that, is that the grid goes from off base. Uh, a lot of the time, uh, water and wastewater is an off base thing. What happens when it, out in the community, the wastewater plant goes down because of flood and you can't flush? Uh, it's not a small problem, trust me. Um, and, and, and so, and as the general pointed out, People live off base. Families live off base. Uh, transportation matters. Uh, utilities matter. All of those pieces are relevant to the installation. And so we can do some work to make the installation resilient, but 
it's also incumbent on those base commanders to work with local communities to make sure the entire place is resilient because, frankly, climate is not going to respect the border and the fence line of the installation. All right, so I have been told that I'm running out of time. Um, I, I tell you what, why don't I just uh, wrap up just a little bit and then I'm going to give everybody an opportunity to sort of make a closing comment because I know when we give everybody a lot of information, you're only going to remember one or two things from the day. I, I know that's a practical reality. So I want to give our panelists the opportunity to give you your takeaway point that you're going to need to remember. My thing that you're going to need to remember, frankly, is that we have a responsibility to pre prepare. We know so much and we see so much about what's happening. And it is basically our responsibility, whether it's DOD or DHS or state, we see these dynamics, and if we don't do anything about it, then it, then frankly, part of the burden and part of the responsibility is on us for having not prepared for the inevitable climate impacts. We look at the eight inches of sea level rise that we've seen over the last hundred years, and some of these projections talk about 80 inches over the next hundred years. That is not a small deal, and we see it coming. And yes, there's some questions about that. But frankly, uh, it's going to be more, and we know it, and we have a responsibility to get ready for it. So I'm going to go down the line here, um, just short comments. What do you want the, the folks here who are watching on TV, who are here in the room, what do you want them uh, to have as their takeaway? Jerry? i just jump to the installation. We're dealing with an uncertain future, and every base has a neighbor. And the, the combination of the base and the neighbor have to plan for what could happen in the future, and we can't ignore that. So we have to keep our vision extended. We have to start working now on what we're doing so that we're ready to, to stay there, be able to carry out our mission, at the same time recognize the needs of the people that are uh, overseas with us or here in the, the CONUS with us, that we're working together to solve this problem of the climate change future. Great. Uh, Admiral White. So I talked about the geo strategic impact of climate change. Think about the geo part, the geo or the geoid that we live on. That's the earth. The earth system is changing. That's the ocean. It's the weather. It's the climate. It's the ice. It's the land. It's all these things that, that we've talked about. Two of the recommendations in our report is one to invest in improvements to improve the data and analysis of what's happening to that geo. The other piece in doing so, we reduce the uncertainty to allow us to plan, act, and react in line with the changes that are happening. Great. General Keyes? I'd just say I'd go back to the planning part. How bad can it be? Can we stand that? What can we do? How much does it cost? How long does it take? And I always ask the question, what if we're wrong? And make your, base your plan on that. Admiral Parker. We all want to invest without regret, whether it's personally or at the government level. Uh, what we've discovered in the Coast Guard is it's five to ten times better financially to invest up front in resilience than it is to do it after the fact through supplementals. I feel like we're backing into a crisis in that regard. To highlight the other point about community, it's not just community. Um, there's a book out called 90% of Everything. 90% of everything that you use in your daily lives comes to you via the marine transportation system. That has nodes that are all in sea level rise impacted areas. And whether that's to manage your daily life or to support the readiness of our services, uh, that's a key point. And it'll be a bellwether for us as we look at that uh, and what the commercial side of that is doing, because they have a quicker turn rate generally than we do in the government. Uh, so I think there's a lot of lessons we can learn uh, from what they're doing, how they're making their facilities more resilient, how it changes their concept of operations, much like we're having to change ours. Uh, I think we've got an example we can pull from. Joan? Well, my final remark would be, and my takeaway for you today would be that, you know, our readiness depends upon our ability to train. And so we have to have capable lands, we have to have access to airspace, to sea space, to do that training. The planning, the, be, the ability to look at how many training days we're losing, how many training events we're losing, the research that we need to do in terms of our systems, our natural infrastructure is going to be critical to actually 
sustain our training land base and to make sure that we have access to our airspace and our sea space in the future. Thank you, everybody. Thanks very much. Uh, I think we're going to have a 10-minute coffee. I'm going to do the admin stuff so you don't have to come up here. We're going to have about a 10-minute coffee break, and then we're going to get together for our second panel. Thanks very much.
Welcome back. Um, for those of you who, who are not with us for the first panel, um, welcome. Uh, this is the, the second panel is going to um, focus on what the, uh, the national security community um, broadly defined, not just DOD, but um, across the government and, and even internationally can do um, and what it, it should be doing to, um, to prepare for some of the effects of um, climate that you heard about in the first panel or hopefully we'll read about in the reports um, if you were not, unable to join us for the first panel. Um, we have another very distinguished group of panelists. Um, we're going to begin with uh, Mr. Frank Fabia, who is one of the co-founders and presidents of the Center for Climate and Security. Um, he has been focus focusing on the effects of climate um, on, on international security and national security for more than a decade. Um, he's written uh, widely on um, the effects on the, the Syrian conflict um, and other areas around the world um, where the effects of climate have caused instability um, and thus required military action. Um, Rear Admiral Phillips um, is a uh, retired surface warfare officer, and um, those of you who do military policy know that that makes her a <laughs> um, rank number one. I, I won't use the term, I will. She's kind of a badass. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of a big deal. <laughs> Um, but she, she has experience um, commanding ships and commanding sailors and, um, and has been engaged in the, um, the past uh, several years in um, uh, programs that focus on integrating um, the understanding of the effects of climate from a local and a municipal level all the way up to a federal level um, in the Tidewater region. Um, Vice Admiral Dave Titley was the former oceanographer of the Navy. He is, um, <laughs> that's a good, you went up. <laughs> this, this is like every event planner's nightmare happening right now. Someone burning the midnight oil, that would be me, typed in <laughs> the incorrect title. Um, well, Admiral, let's, let's shorten it. Admiral Totley um, is an expert um, on um, the effects of climate on our ocean. Um, on our naval service, um, and and he is um, actually one of the most trusted groups in in the United States. When people talk about scientists that they trust, um, you know, if if you go back to your constituencies and you talk to the general public about the scientists they trust most, it will be your local meteorologist. And um, and Dave is a meteorologist. Um, he's an oceanographer, a meteorologist, and he is going to talk to you a bit about the science and how um, our understanding of the science of um, how uh, climate is affecting um, the, the the globe sphere, I believe was the term, um, is changing. Um, <laughs> John Conger, um, who moderated the first panel, um, has vast experience in understanding um, all of our military installations and is um, going to speak a bit about that, but also more broadly um, how DOD can prepare for these issues. And um, Ms. Sherry Goodman is um, I like to say the fairy godmother of climate security. She's been focusing on climate security and environmental security um, for, for decades and has really led the way in thinking about these issues in um, both a very, you know, a strategic way but an interdisciplinary way and also um, in, in a way where these issues fit into our understanding of how nations relate to one another. Um, and can interact with one another on the global stage. Um, so hopefully she will be able to touch on some of those points. Um, but without further ado, uh, Frank, if you could maybe talk about a little bit about the report that we've put out. Great. Um, thanks so much, Heather. I'm going to be pretty brief. Um, as Heather mentioned earlier, at, you know, before the first panel, um, a lot of the, pan the other panelists here are each over 200 years old, so they have a lot more wisdom. Wis they have a lot more wisdom than I have. So um, I'm just going to frame uh, this discussion a bit, um, which is based on uh, this report. You know, first of all, this climate and security advisory group um, is, it's a security group that's looking at climate change. Um, it's not a climate or environmental group that's looking uh, at security. And I think that's very important. It includes 45 uh, senior experts uh, in the field. Uh, I'm sorry, 54 uh, senior experts in the field uh, that come from uh, military and national security backgrounds. Uh, and you'll, you're going to hear from, from some of them today. Um, 
The inspiration for this for this version of the report, it's, it's, it's basically an update from, from a 2016 report we put out before the election, uh, is actually in a lot of ways, I think, came from Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis's comments um, uh, in the questions for the record uh, that he received uh, when he was talking about climate change and what he would do as SecDef, as the Secretary of Defense, uh, to deal with this issue. Uh, and he essentially said, well, this, this impacts us in a lot of different ways. Uh, it impacts our troops. Uh, it impacts our readiness, our operations. Uh, it impacts strategy. Uh, but this is going to require a whole of government approach. Um, I think he understands um, you know, quite well that this is a non-traditional problem that's going to require uh, that a number of different agencies across the U.S. government uh, um, you know, uh, address and address together. Um, given the intersection of risks. And we heard a little bit about that in the last panel, about you know, the intersection of climate and nuclear security, for example, which is not something uh, many of us think about very often. Um, and, and then John Conger earlier uh, mentioned, uh, which is the theme of this, this report, so he just happened to mention it. Thanks, John. Um, the, <laughs> the responsibility to prepare, and really, that's, it's, it's, it's simple, I think, um, based on the amount of knowledge we have um, the degree to which we've reduced uh, uncertainty um, on, on this risk, um, we know a lot. Um, and when you, when you compare what we know about what the climate is doing uh, and the projections we have for what the climate's going to do to our projections for other social, economic, and political and security dynamics uh, and you know, what we know is going to happen in that space. For example, will there be a weapon of mass destruction detonated in the next 30 years? Um, there's so much uncertainty around an issue like that. Um, we actually have quite a bit of uncertainty, I mean, of certainty on this issue. And as risk managers in the security community, I think generally thinks of itself as, as, as you know, a community that manages risk and reduces unacceptable risk. Um, we, uh, we, 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 need to do, we need to take that information and, uh, and, and deal with it. Uh, and so the responsibility prepares about having, dealing with an unprecedented risk, but also um, recognizing that we have unprecedented foresight uh, to, to, to see these risks coming and to deal with them. So it reminds me of the, I think it's the first Austin Powers movie where the, that guard is, uh, is, has his hand up and there's a steamroller coming very slowly towards him. And he doesn't get out of the way. He just screams for a while until he's run over. And I think we, we see this coming and we can deal with it. And so I think that is really, I mean, maybe that I'm dating myself. Austin, Austin Powers won, but, um, you know, so, but there you go. It, it comes to my mind. Um, and specifically uh, within this report, we've looked at three different categories of actions um, that, that we think can be taken by the U.S. government and supported by the Congress uh, in this area. And, and that is assess, prepare, and support. I'll be very quick. On assess, uh, basically what we're talking about is um, recommendations for how we can improve our assessments of climate risk to security. Uh, and uh, for this, for many in this audience, uh, that's going to take I think, um, you know, support from the Congress uh, to, to help the DOD, the State Department, the intelligence community, and other agencies who deal with this issue on, from a security perspective um, continue to do that. That's very important. Prepare is the second bit, and that's really about uh, authorities and investments, um, you know, uh, related to adapting to uh, climate change. Uh, and that's incredibly important. Um, as you've heard in the previous panel, and as you'll hear uh, more about today. Um, the Department of Defense understands these risks in a lot of ways, and a lot of that understanding comes from on the ground dealing with this issue in the various, you know, combatant commands, for example, dealing with uh, countries uh, in their area of responsibility and, and, and seeing these risks on the ground. So um, we need, as policymakers and as, as civil society, to support, uh, to, to follow that lead and, uh, and help uh, our government prepare for climate change risks to security. The last bit is support, and uh, sounds really general, but what we're talking about in this report is how can we also look at climate risk to our partner and allied nations and think of supporting those partner and allied nations, not just to deal with climate change uh, and the humanitarian consequences. That's incredibly important in our military, State Department, USAID, other agencies have a role to play in doing that, but also to think about it strategically. 
How do investments in climate adaptation, investments in our partner nations and allies and prospective partner nations and allies in certain geostrategically important areas like the Asia Pacific region, um, how do those investments actually help you know, uh, uh, generate uh, influence for the United States uh, in these competing spaces. What are we doing, you know, uh, around these issues in the South China Sea, and how does that, you know, affect our relationship with China? And so, um, so there are a set of recommendations along those lines. Um, you know, we have we have uh, a number of countries leading on this issue now within the UN Security Council. Um, how can the U.S. support? Uh, dealing with this issue at that level of, of international security as well. So, um, so that's kind of the broad framework of this, and I'll uh, I'll shut up now and hand it over to Anne. Did you want to introduce Anne? Oh, you already did. Okay. So, sorry. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm honored to be here today with such a, a distinguished panel, and uh, also wish to thank the first panel for uh, their tremendous efforts, not only on behalf of their, their full careers in national security, but for uh, their continued work in this area and um, for their uh, gems of wisdom, which I hope everyone wrote down, uh, that, that they can, you can carry forward, that they put forth this morning. So um, as Heather mentioned, I am a surface warfare officer. Um, the particular descriptor used has not been used before, to my knowledge. Um, but I did drive ships for 31 years. I'm an operator in that context. And, uh, and so that means I focus on how to assess, prepare, train, and execute a mission or a task. Um, my initial experience with climate and national security comes from my time working as chair of the Surface Force Working Group for the Navy's Task Force Climate Change, where I was working for Admiral Titley. And uh, while I was still on active duty, and then from chairing uh, the Infrastructure Working Group for the Hampton Roads Intergovernmental Pilot Planning Project, uh, which was Admiral White brought up uh, briefly in his comments this morning, and now as a member of the advisory board for the Center for Climate and Security. Uh, so Frank teed up beautifully, um, without notes I might add, um, uh, the context of the responsibility to prepare strengthening national and homeland security in the face of changing climate as a roadmap and recommendations that the government can use to move forward on this really existential threat to our national security. I, I can't overstate that. Um, I'd like to talk about three kind of basic points today. The first is uh, that this problem, this challenge that we have in dealing with climate impact on our national security is a risk management issue, first and foremost. We speak about the Department of Defense as having a history of taking climate impact seriously because it creates and intensifies real risk and global instability. But to fully understand and prepare for what lies ahead to, for us there, we've got to continue to incorporate the evolving dynamics and impacts of climate change um, in our risk assessment processes for both military and civilian infrastructure. And that came up right at the end of the last panel. But it's absolutely critical that we not only focus internally to federal facilities, but that we look externally as well. Um, we must have a process to include projecting future risk. And this is a real challenge, particularly when you look, I use sea level rise as an example, because that's what I focus on, particularly since I live in Hampton Roads. But um, flood mapping is based on historical data. We know that we will not have historical conditions in our future. There is no point to planning based on historical data when you're looking at what you're going to do to operate and maintain bases that are in a floodplain. We have got to look at projected future data. We have to understand what's happening, and we have to develop our planning processes based on what we know is coming or our best estimate of what we know is coming, not based on what's happened in the past. That is a quantum shift in the way we think as a federal agency, as within the Department of Defense. We just aren't used to looking that far down the road. So to, to be able to do that, We've absolutely got to keep collecting the best science, the best engineering data available, expanding our modeling capacity, and focusing it on understanding dependencies and interdependencies, both inside and outside the fence line. The previous panel mentioned that bases predominantly get their utilities and, and their support systems from outside the base. Well, if those systems are interrupted, the base is at risk. There are ways to minimize that risk and reduce that risk, but at the end of the day, you're still very dependent on the surrounding community. If you use Hampton Roads as an example, 1.7 million people, 29 federal facilities, all surrounded by 17 cities and municipalities. Um, a, an anecdote I've heard, this commanding officer of the weapons station at York, Yorktown lived in Suffolk. He went through four cities and over two bridges to get to work every morning. So that's the way life is in Hampton Roads. There's water everywhere. It's our largest military presence really outside of this area, of the Washington, D.C. area. There are very unique facilities there, 
and it's all vulnerable. If we don't plan with the cities incorporated in the planning process with the federal agencies, there is no way we're going to come up with a solution for our future. That's just, just an anecdote because that's where, where you stand as a function of where you sit uh, or maybe where you live. Uh, so anticipatory projections, continual revision and reassessment of how we collect data and what data we collect and how we're processing it to best be available for federal, state, and local to help make decisions for our future. Second uh, point, climate change adaptation as discussed, whole of government and community approach is absolutely critical, uh, both inside and outside the fence line and the whole basis of this product, a responsibility to prepare. That preparation drives the need to share this information across the full range, not only of within federal agencies, but with state and local authorities as well, so we can understand climate and security risks and, and focus on what is most needed to help us prepare for the future. Actionable and accessible, I think, is, is, uh, my, would be my two key words there. Um, we talked earlier, Frank mentioned unprecedented foresight. Because of the data and the processes we already have, we know what's coming. We don't need to have the conversation about, well, maybe this will happen, maybe it won't. Let's set standards, let's pick scenarios at the federal level that we're going to plan to, and then update them over time. But without, we have the foresight to know what's coming, we have to take action and get started. This is an area where the federal government can really help some state and local agencies move forward. We also, I think, are faced in this context with an unprecedented risk. And so what we do now to strengthen and standardize assessment processes we have, to be able to look downrange more than 20 years, which we do now for installation master plans, uh, to understand what's happening, and then to quantify what our options are. We don't do a very good job of understanding costs or impact at the local level and, and even within the federal facilities at the, at the individual base level. Um, there has been some recent activity in this area. Uh, General Galloway referred to the climate-related risk to DOD infrastructure. Uh, CELVAS, it's an initial vulnerability assessment report, came out January 29th of this year based on um, 3,500 facilities globally were asked to assess climate impact across flooding, storm and non-storm surge, extreme temperatures, wind, drought, and wildfire. This, this qualitative assessment does not include costs, but nearly 50% of the reporting sites reported damage from one or more of those six categories of risk. Um, and this is just an assessment that was done individually, base by base, so one person's analysis is maybe not the same as someone on a different facility in a different part of the world. Over 25% of the site surveys reported flooding impact of some variety. Hmm. So this, in this purely qualitative survey, with 50% of the sites reporting some kind of impact, we know we have a need to continue to move forward to understand what's happening here and how we're going to prepare for it. In a related document actually released earlier, November 2017, GAO uh, Climate Change Adaptation concluded that the Department of Defense still needs to better incorporate adaptation and planning into overseas operations. What they were looking for was a consistent, and this is a need, a consistent method to understand risk, to be able to project, to determine fiscal planning needs for the future, and to develop consistent processes that understand, track, and assess that risk. So a cycle of feedback, uh, maybe anticipatory governance, to quote Leon Forth's work, uh, where you are projecting for the future, you see how things are changing, you update your projections as, your ch as you notice changes and as you pick up on the data that you're going to collect that's going to determine how climate impact is impacting your facilities. I should note that when this, in the Selective Vulnerability Study, uh, top, the top two areas that were critically impacted were aviation operations and transportation. The area that was called out as being the least impacted was logistics and supply. Now, if you think about that, those two things don't go together. It's not possible for logistics and supply not to be interrupted at all if aviation and transportation infrastructure is at the top of the list. So somehow we got to improve our understanding here so that we can actually document what the heck is going on here and understand how we're going to move forward. And this is a real challenge for us. We don't, within DOD, have a great process right now to understand what's actually happening and document impact to our on-base facilities based on things that are happening off the base. We don't have a great way of doing that. 
On February 14th of this year, in congressional testimony before the Senate Armed Services Committee, the four vice chiefs were asked by Senator Kane to talk about their services preparations and consideration for climate impact. They all related the imperative nature of comprehensive assessments and preparation on infrastructure and activities to ensure operational readiness. In some cases, they called out specific facilities, and we talked about the Naval Academy at the last panel. So while all of these are significant starts, there is a great deal more to be done. And this responsibility to prepare roadmap and recommendations is intended as a guidance to help focus that work, assess climate risk across the full range of federal and homeland security facilities, and to ensure a whole of government approach to meeting national security needs in the time in response to climate and the changes that we know are coming. And to be able to leverage the full capacity and capability of our national security enterprise, the data we already have, the processes and models we already have to evaluate and share actionable information. So we're a nation of action. It's up to us to prepare and face the challenges of, the, of our changing climate, and we really have no time to lose. Thank you. Thank, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, and, and thanks very much to, uh, to Admiral Phillips there. You actually covered a lot of, a lot of points. I, I may talk about them because sometimes, uh, at least I find this when teaching my, my students, that sometimes when something is said maybe two slightly different ways, one of them will, will resonate and, uh, and it will, will stay with you because there were some exceptionally important points that Admiral Phillips uh, made there. At first, I was actually going to say that, you know, I, I think I may need to make General Keyes an honorary oceanographer. It was uh, actually pretty impressive listening to him talk about the science there. And I understand, sir, that uh, the Air Weather Service needs some help, and, uh, and I think I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, get you, uh, I'll get you in contact with them. Uh, so I'm supposed to talk about the science. So here's my bottom line, which you may or may not like. This is actually not about the science. If we want to have a science discussion or a science debate or whatever, come talk to me afterwards. I'm happy to do that. Uh, usually when you find people who want to debate or, or sort of uh, pick on the science, it's usually because they don't want to address the policy implications. And the longer you can talk about something that you don't actually have anything to do, you kind of ignore what you really should be talking about. But as I said in my TED talk, the ice actually doesn't care who's uh, either in the White House or who's in the Congress, it just melts. So we're gonna deal with this one way or the other. It's a whole lot better if to the degree we can, we can deal with it in a managed and planned process uh, with branches and sequels and all the things that we're really good at doing in the Department of Defense, rather than a pure reaction and crisis mode, in which case we just fly the C-17s over, dump money out the back end, and usually waste half of it in, in that case. We don't want to do that. It's been brought up several times that we have uh, really unprecedented knowledge about this. So what the science has given us is while we don't know everything, we know a lot. Uh, and we know a lot in comparison to many of the issues that the Department of Defense deals with every day. I mean, I'll tell you, if, if DNI Coates could tell me as much about Russia and China 50 years from now as I could tell him about the climate, we would find wherever he is, stop his schedule, fly him to the White House, and give him a Medal of Freedom this afternoon. It would be amazing intelligence. And I'm not picking on the intel guys. They're dealing with people. All I'm dealing with is nonlinear fluid dynamics. It's a lot easier. Uh, it is. Uh, people are hard. Physics is relatively simple there. So here's the way I kind of think about this. Three words, because it's, this stuff gets really, really complex and people can get drowned in the details. Uh, people, it's water, it's change. I'm not going to talk too much about the people and the water. You'll notice there are no polar bears in there. This is people, water, and change. Let me just talk about the change. And Admiral Phillips mentioned it, but I think it's very, very important. Uh, we have for, really, for pretty much our entire country's history and certainly our military's history, when we've built, be it a weapon system, be it a base, uh, a training range, we have traditionally looked back somewhere between 30 and 100 years, you add 10% or 5% for safety and you go build it or you design it and you, you acquire it. That's pretty much how we've done stuff. Uh, we can no longer get away with that. We are in an era where the climate, regardless of our 
uh, policy on greenhouse gases will change. I can guarantee you it will change for all of your lifetimes. It will change for your children's lifetimes, and it will almost certainly change for your grandchildren's lifetimes, at least, probably a lot longer than that. Uh, the sea level rise, uh, we're not talking eight inches. We're probably already, already locked into a long-term sea level rise of five, six, seven, eight feet. And we will probably lock ourselves into a sea level rise of somewhere between 15 and 30 feet, depending on ultimately where we stabilize greenhouse gases. So Stephen Coven, Covey famously said, begin with the end in mind. Now, does this mean we're gonna build 30-foot levees? No, we're not. We can't afford it and we probably wouldn't do it. But we can think about reasonably where do we go out to for, let's say, 50 to 100 years. And there is a range of projections. So what you do is think of that first phase. Let's say it's a levee. And I don't know if uh, General Galloway is still here. He'll probably cringe with me talking about levees and stuff. But if you think you're going to need to build a really big one, then buy the property now that will support that. Put the foundation in that will support it. But maybe you don't need to build to three or four meters now. Maybe you need to build to one, you know, three feet, four feet. Do that. And then as has been mentioned already on this panel and on the previous panel, you kind of row out to your tide gauge every day and kind of see where it is. It's like, yeah, we're on track. So maybe 20 years later, I need to put another meter or meter and a half. Maybe for whatever reason, we're all wrong in the science and it stabilizes. Don't spend the money, spend it on something else. Maybe we're wrong and it's coming up faster, so it's not 20 years, it's five years you have to put it on. And that's kind of how you can do this uh, preparation, think smartly at the beginning, and then continue to build. And that's what our report here uh, talks, we, we talk about there. So that's, I think, I think it's important. What came up in the previous panel was sort of the nuisance flooding and the extremes, and they're kind of related. Uh, the nuisance flooding, when you have water around your ankles every day or sort of every high tide, yes, that gets to be a pain. And eventually, if it crosses a threshold, it can be quite disruptive because it goes down into the basements and floods the generators or where all the IT stuff is. But then the extremes, and really without even making any suppositions if hurricanes or typhoons will get stronger, let's just say that's somewhat uncertain. They probably will get stronger, but I'll give to people, maybe they won't, possible. Just the fact that they're coming in on an ever higher sea level means they're gonna do more and more damage. And that damage doesn't just go up a little bit. It, again, comes over these thresholds. <coughs> Think of Sandy. You know, what did it flood out? It flooded out part of the subway system. Why? Because it got to that threshold. And you can pretty well say that if you had had the exact same storm a century ago coming in on lower uh, sea level, I mean, again, assuming you had a New York City subway system like we do today a century ago, you would not have flooded. So that wasn't just a little bit of money, that was billions of dollars of money because it comes up and that's going to keep getting, getting expensive. So the cost curve really comes up. We just mentioned the, the Arctic. It is in our responsibility. It sometimes gets lost. Uh, I'm not quite sure, very honestly, how much the Pentagon as a whole is focusing on the Arctic. I can tell you a little bit of history because we're distinguished. And what does distinguished mean? Old, uh, at least for me. At least in academia, whenever somebody says you're distinguished, that means they're saying you're old. Uh, so when we talk about the Arctic, the Arctic is really why the Navy got into climate change. This is what CNO Roughhead, Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Gary Roughhead started. That's why, why we have Task Force Climate Change started nine years ago this, this spring. Uh, just in case you hadn't seen, there was a Russian liquid natural gas tanker, an LNG tanker, that went from Norway to South Korea across the top of Russia. We call it the Northern Sea Route. It did it in February. Last I checked, that was winter in the Arctic. And it did it without an icebreaker. No icebreaker, just an ice-hardened commercial ship. And it did it 19 days faster than going through the Suez Canal. Is that a game changer? You guys tell me. So are we paying attention? I think I know the answer to that one, but we're going to. So we're either gonna react or we can anticipate. And that's kind of, kind of our choice there. So uh, I think I'm going to, let me make one last point, then I'm gonna pass it on to John. And I think actually John might have kind of touched on some of this in the first uh, poll. It's really easy when we read, uh, whether it's our CSAG 
uh, recommendations on a panel like this, we're all kind of technocrats at some level, senior military, senior uh, former, former uh, uh, civilians in, in, in the, primarily in the, in the Pentagon here. Uh, but we tend not to always think of the human dimension. There are tremendous human dimensions to these, to these issues. And if we ignore them or minimize them, we will probably get the policies wrong because those human dimensions tend to be constituents and they tend to talk to their elected representatives and they tend to vote. Uh, so we have to make sure that we are listening to them. If anybody didn't see the uh, article in Sunday's New York Times, uh, I, I, I haven't read them all, but there's a, a wonderful one on a little tiny town south of New Orleans, Lafitte, Louisiana. And, it, and you really get a feel of the human dimension. Uh, I had a house that was five miles away of landfall in Hurricane Katrina. I can tell you all about how the Mississippi coast to this day is still trying to recover from that hurricane 13 years ago. Uh, and if we, if we just sort of not, do not account for that, you know, we may come up with wonderful technical policies that make a lot of sense, but if we haven't done the groundwork to help uh, really our entire citizens and our population understand why these unprecedented changes are going to be needed. And we've talked about how these bases do not exist in a vacuum. The communities have to come along. Uh, if we don't do that, I think we're going to make a hard problem even harder. But, but we know about this and we can work that. So let me stop there and let me pass this on to uh, John. Thank you very much. Okay. Hello again, everybody. Um, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna try and stay focused and narrow in in my remarks in this panel. Um, we we talked about this framework of res, uh, responsibility to prepare and how it had three pieces. There's this assess piece where you have to understand what's going on. And then there's a prepare piece, and then there's a support piece. As we get to my part of the story, we're going to talk about preparing. I um, when I was in the Pentagon, I had responsibility for all of DOD's installations. And that meant that I got to see warts and all how, how they're managed. A lot of the time, the, the fact of the matter is, is that DOD installations are underfunded. So the idea that somebody's going to come in and say, I want to spend uh, a couple billion dollars shoring up this base is, well, ludicrous. Um, so, so let's not pretend that everybody's going to fix all of these problems. But it is about a trillion dollars worth of uh, real property, and we do want to preserve it as best we can. Fortunately, there's a lot that you can do to mitigate some of the worst problems. I, um, so General Keyes t talked a bit about Langley earlier, and I had data when I was in the Pentagon that talked about how it, um, Early storms that Langley encountered caused $100 million plus dollars of damage because of the flooding. And then they went and developed a sandbag plant. And lo and behold, the damage costs went down by an order of magnitude. Still did damage. They still had to go out and get sandbags, so they still had floods, but they had less damage. It, it's the, uh, it's, and now they're building door dams and actually saying, well, we fled often enough that rather than going out and doing sandbags every time, we're just going to put door dams in front, which is the structures that basically stop the, the, the water from getting in the door. And the, the point being that, that preparation happens and is happening today. Um, I, I have another anecdote, and I'll, I'll sort of come back thematically in a second. But Fort Irwin, uh, there was a study in 2011. It's in the middle of the Mojave Desert. It's dry there. And, and, there's, and, and so they have water issues. And so th there was a study that came out that said they only have 20 years of water. Well, what do you do when a base runs out of water? Well, you know, there are some things, but, but um, the base decided to mitigate. The base decided to adapt. The base found another reservoir. The base put energy, uh, water efficiency in place, and now they, they're projecting about 50 years worth of water, as, uh, and they'll do something else as they get closer to that point in time. The point being that uh, once you recognize a problem, you have to prepare for that problem, and you have to be able to deal with it. Not every problem are you going to be able to deal with. If you have, you know, 15 to 30 foot sea level rises, there's only so much you can do other than move. But, but the fact of the matter is, is that in a lot of these locations, they have spe location-specific problems that they can begin to address. So 
what do you think they should do? Well, the first thing is they all have to figure out what their location-specific problems are. Um, there is a, a report that's been required by Congress to the Department of Defense to identify which bases are most at risk from climate change. And some of these problems are going to be wildfire problems. Some of these problems are going to be drought. Some of them are going to be sea level rise. And, and at each of these locations that they identify, they probably need to, not on the back of an envelope and not on a single sheet of paper, but develop a real plan to say, okay, I know what my problems are. What is it going to take for me to mitigate the impact on my operations, on my training, on my people in order to continue to do my job? Um, that's that's going to be a process that's going to take a little bit of time. Now, uh, we, we all talk like... Um, uh, you know, these sea level rises that we're talking about are going to be uh, immediate, and they're not, right? I mean, it, it's going to take some time for, for the water to come. The water's here in a lot of places, but, you know, if you imagined um, over a 30-year period, you're talking about a foot or two of, of sea level rise, as, and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking a little bit, D Dave is going to be the one who's going to be able to tell you whether that's a realist or prediction, but the projections that I've seen, are, you know, fall in that range for the next few decades. In the Pentagon, the COCOMs think in two-year spans. Most people think in five-year spans because that's what your budget plan is. And, and, and so getting people to think about decades, that's a challenge. But, but most buildings are around for 30 or 50 years, and so you want it to actually be useful for the 30 or 50 years. And so you have to start thinking in terms of master plans and on your bases and how, uh, how, how am I going to do things differently when I expect this to be the situation in 30 or 50 years. In 100 years, it'll be worse. But nobody's spending money on problems that are a century away when some of these bases weren't there 100 years ago. So you'll probably get to address those problems when you get closer to that point in time. Today, we're starting to think about the problems that are in, you know, in the approximate. When do you start, when do you get off the train tracks? When you hear the whistle blow? When you hear the engine? When you see it in front of you? When you can feel the wind on you? When do you jump off the train tracks? Well, your heart gets to race a little bit different speeds depending on when you pick. And frankly, when we start to mitigate our, our, our problem, uh, it's going to cost a different amount of money if we start today, far ahead of time. Um, frankly, we're not far ahead of time anymore, but, but, but um, some of them we are, some of the problems we are. Are we going to do it today or are we going to wait till it's a crisis? Different amount of money. And so, so let's think about that. Uh, in that context. Um, have we got f assessments of all our, our bases and um, what, where, the, where the bases are which have, are going to have water shortages? Do we have plant, um, maps of all of our locations for the projected sea level rise? And uh, are we prepared to avoid new construction and floodplains? Are we prepared not to have uh, backup power or IT systems in the basement where they're going to get flooded? Um, how much have we had conversations with local communities about regional resilience? I made the point earlier, and it's still true, that those, those communities are indispensable to our military installations. And so uh, if you isolate and make the base resilient when the community isn't, you haven't really made the base resilient. The, uh, the, you know, the fact of the matter is, I, st quick story. Um, when I first got to the Pentagon in 09, uh, we were all talking about six-month power outages. Oh, there are these uh, events that can occur where you lose power in a large region in the United States for many months at a time. Well, let me tell you, once you're through about a week, your mission on your base changes to civilian support, okay? You're, you're not trying to make the base continue to do operate as usual for six months. That's, that's ridiculous. You can't hold all the other variables constant. And, and, and the same thing's true here. You can't just focus on the resilience of the individual installation. You have to start preparing with the community and partnering with the community in order to deal with things. There are a whole host of other recommendations in here. I, again, I go back to the installation piece of the puzzle uh, because it's what I know best. Um, but let me touch one other quick thing on the Arctic, another quick story. So when I was in the Pentagon uh, and I was doing climate change stuff for the infrastructure, you know, I was you know, doing the practical, realistic stuff. And, and these policy people in the other part of the uh, Pentagon dealt with international affairs, and, uh, and, and it was all fluffy. And I, my, what I would always, uh, you know, criticize them for is, you know, they, they wrote 
these documents for internal consumption that were like German philosophy. They took a page to say what they could say in a sentence. And, uh, and, and, and so, you know, I would be moderately critical. And so then they come out with this DOD Arctic strategy. I read it, it didn't say anything, and I told them as much. And, 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 um, but I was being cynical and I was uninformed, and, 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 and I, learned, I th thought about it a little bit, and I thought, all right, so if they're thinking out, if they're the only people in the department thinking out decades, and they're trying to figure out how to act today uh, to deal with setting the stage for problem sets 30 years out, well, what would you do? Well, you'd start to build relationships and you'd start thinking about how you would do search and rescue and you'd start talking about rules of engagement with uh, different folks about trade routes. And lo and behold, I went back to the document and that's really what they all said. So, all right, I don't know everything and I wouldn't pretend to know everything, although I have occasionally pretended to know everything. Um, and, and, and so that kind of thinking ahead of time, thinking what am I going to do today to head off a 30-year problem, maybe you're not actually taking that big an event action today, um, but you are setting the stage because doing things far, far enough ahead of time it is an easier thing. That's what we're saying. And so we have to think those things through and take those actions today so that we don't reach crisis points. So with that, um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop and I'm going to hand things over to Sherry, um, who's going to close out. Thanks. Okay, thank you, John, and it's terrific to be with you all this morning. First, I would like to thank the people who helped bring this event together today because it takes a lot of work. Heather, you've done a very nice job. I know you've been working very hard on this, uh, along with the team from the Center for Climate Security, Frank and Caitlin. I want to thank our partners, Laura Glitzen at, at Jackson and Carol Werner with EESI. Um, we've all been uh, swimming in this sea for a number of years now, uh, and it's, it's really a team and collective effort, and glad to see a number of new faces here uh, this morning. And also thank you to my fellow members of the CNA Military Advisory Board, the current chairman, General Keyes, uh, Dave Titley, I think I see uh, Jerry Galloway and other affiliates here as well, so thank you all. Uh, for the service you've continued um, to provide. So the framework for this part of the discussion is the responsibility to prepare. And that is a very fundamentally important concept. Um, you know, we, we think about um, the nuclear threat that we face, and we think about the years we've been had uh, for the last 50 plus years during the Cold War where we understood we were living in an era of strategic stability or nuclear stability. And now we find ourselves in an era with less nuclear stability than we faced arguably over the last several decades. And so um, there's more tension. Uh, we're investing more as a nation uh, to prepare because we understand the responsible actions are to prepare to uh, assess um, that risk, um, to prepare for it, um, and for a threat that is a, we hope is still a low probability, but one that could of course be a high consequence. During the Cold War, we, we prepared for the canonical bolt out of the blue nuclear attack by the Soviet Union, and we were successful. Now we're in a new post-Cold War era. But we're also in the climate era. Um, and in the climate era, um, we have uh, also a responsibility to prepare for those climate risks, because we live actually in a time of climate instability. And that's been now well articulated um, both by our panelists this morning and for any of you who've read any of the literature, the climate has become unstable. So what, how do we prepare for, uh, to act in, so we have this unpre unprecedented risk, okay? And so the piece I'm gonna talk about 
you know, we've talked about the assessing and preparing and now supporting our allies and partner nations. And I want to, th I'll, I'll um, introduce three, mention three types of um, cases, one of which has already been discussed extensively this morning, the Arctic, where of course we know the climate has become highly unstable and that's what's led to the opening of the Arctic and a whole new geographic region where we have a responsibility to prepare to be able to operate there and where arguably the U.S. Um, has still a long way to go to be prepared to operate safely and securely in that region. Um, also, the Asia-Pacific region, which also many would say, uh, and I've characterized it as sort of disaster alley uh, for extreme weather events from cyclones to tsunamis um, that are putting, and also the region of the world where you have many of the mega cities, so you've got a combination of demographics, uh, political instability, and climate instability all leading to very high risks. And you have former Pacific Commander Admiral Locklear who said it's one of the most serious threats uh, he faces in that, that, the, that we face in the region is the climate risk. And then um, finally, uh, you know, Africa, which is subject to increasingly severe droughts, Northern Africa across the Sahel and into the Middle East, uh, some of that climate driven and we've seen the instability. I won't go through some of those cases right now, but that's in part contributed to the massive mu wave of migration, the greatest wave of migration that we've seen um, since World War II. Now, at the same time, we have this unprecedented foresight um, in, this, in this era, a combination of advanced technologies, um, big data, analytics, artificial intelligence. Um, and we also have the ability to begin to close the gap between uh, reliable weather forecasting and longer term climate models, what, uh, what some call seasonal to subseasonal uh, forecasting and prediction. And as we close, it, close that gap between weather and climate, the two weeks to two months of subseasonal forecasting and the two months to 12 months of seasonal forecasting, we will begin and, and, and in, adapt that along with the advanced technology, big data tools. We really get to a place where we can begin to climate proof our institutions and our infrastructure. And that is vitally important. That, re that enables this to be a business case not just, uh, not just a nice to have. And that's important for all of our institutions. So we need to work, and we've said in this report, working with our allies and partner nations becomes essential. First of all, we, we don't go to war by ourselves. When we conduct a military operation, it's always with allied and partner nations. And they are, at their, obviously, in infrastructure, forces, ability to operate, and threats are all at risk as well. Um, and we already know now that other nations are using potential adversaries as well as uh, partners are using the ability to begin climate proofing in their actions as a way to advance their own leadership. And you have to look nowhere other than China, the recent Arctic, Arctic policy, um, which I've um, characterized as sort of the, the spider's web in the, belt, in the Belt and Road Initiative, now extending China's Belt and Road Initiative beyond just the road and rail into, into Eurasia and down into South Asia, but now extending, think of the map, up into the Arctic and across the northern sea route. Um, and that polar silk road fully acknowledges it, it, the climate risk that is faced in the region and also the opportunities that come from it. So we ignore that risk and that opportunity um, at our peril. But we do, have the, uh, we do have the opportunity with this unprecedented foresight that we have today to work closely 
with our allies and partner nations across a range of key institutions, from the UN Security Council, where now um, uh, there is a lot of beginning to be more leadership and attention to the responsibility to prepare. I don't know if that was, did you already talk about that earlier today? Um, in the uh, in December, in the ARIA dialogues that the Dutch um, Foreign Ministry led, along with our own Caitlin Whirl, discussion on responsibility to prepare that is going to bring be brought forward further um, in this coming year. And so I see this as an emerging and important recognition of the climate risk and the opportunity in that form. Also, NATO has begun to look at uh, climate risks, the European Union and the European Action Service, as well as uh, their armed forces, and then in ASEAN and many of the nations, key nations, Japan in particular, um, and Australia have begun to take this up uh, very deliberately. Even now in South Asia, even the Pakistan, Pakistani military has begun to look at how to do climate training for its forces. Um, and so we know that our military, you know, becomes the 911 force for disaster relief. They need to be trained, they need to be prepared, and be able to work with uh, partner nations with the tools that are now available uh, through advanced technologies, through digital visualization, uh, um, and other tools to be able to uh, assess the risk, prepare for it, and then work responsibly with other nations to support uh, adequate preparations. I think I'll stop there and we'll uh, turn it back to Heather for moderate Q&A. Thank you guys. Um, that, that was pretty comprehensive, um, but I think we have a little time for um, some Q&A with the audience, and, and I would just like to take the privilege of the chair to, um, to, to ask um, a couple of questions. I think, um, you know, in my mind as you guys are framing this, um, you know, thinking through how Congress looks at policy issues um, and how it gets um, stovepiped sometimes, unfortunately, this is this is a real opportunity to try to break down some of those stovepipes and and talk, you know, across committees, across issues, <coughs> um, to to really look for more comprehensive solutions. But um, but just to put it back in the box a little bit, um, I think what we really hit on that um, you know a lot of the defense committees might look at this, or if you're a national security analyst, you might look at this, is you know, you've got three three legs of this stool, and the first one is the intel, the understanding, the analysis. Um, you know, the second one is is readiness, planning and budgeting, resourcing and training. Um, you know, you care about both your personnel and your stuff, and the place that your stuff lives. So your installations, not just domestically and um, you know, but also our installations overseas that um, may be impacted by these issues. And then I think Sherry really hit on, um, you know, what is the, the more sort of overarching issue. And this is, you always want to integrate your, your grand strategic goals, your interests, your national interests, economic and security, um, you know, down through your operations, your process, your planning, your training, and, and your people. Like Dave said, um, you know, people are, are hard. And even harder than people is culture. Um, and, you know, integrating climate into, um, you know, our risk analysis is really a shift in culture in the national security community. And it's not one that is unprecedented. Um, every time we have new technology that evolves on the battlefield, air power, the use of airplanes, the use of AI, um, you know, any time we have, um, you know, a new, a new global paradigm, the, you know, the rise of, of nuclear energy and nuclear weapons. We have to shift um, how, we, how we view the risk um, that these issues might um, present, both at a tactical and operational level, but also at a, a geostrategic level. So um, I think Sherry really hit on how, um, you know, not just as a nation, but as a global community, um, you know, we need to really look at these existential risks that, that climate um, presents in, in a comprehensive way, not just looking at our militaries, but also our other instruments of, um, you know, international engagement. So through USAID and through the State Department, through our diplomacy, um, and even as, um, you know, 
folks on the Hill would often raise um, to, to folks in the bureaucracy through, um, you know, citizens groups and through, um, through industry. And so, um, you know, I would just, just sort of point out that the role of the private sector in helping provide some solutions to, to these issues um, may be something that, that we all want to think about, um, you know, as we're looking at the intel, the analysis, the data, but also the on-the-ground operations um, and changes that may, may take place. Um, so, uh, but back to, I'm sorry, when I was at Brookings, I used to say, if you have a question, please end it with a question mark. <laughs> Um, so I will, I will end that, that quick summary um, with, with, a, with a question, and um, that is, uh, you know, for, for the panelists, the, how can Congress, um, you know, in your view, actually engage on some of these specific um, recommendations that were made um, by, by the report? So I, th I think maybe we can start with Sherry and move back. Sure, and I'll also say I see some hands going up, so I know Heather will want to get um, to, to the questions next. Uh, I, th I think importantly, Congress um, in its oversight role can um, engage during the hearing process um, by asking the important, the important questions about what our institutions, whether it's the Department of Defense, as we heard in the posture hearings last week, all the vice chiefs and the vice commandants were asked questions about um, how they're assessing um, and preparing for climate risks to their military inst installations and institutions. We heard about Paris Island and the Arctic, um, a as well as wildfire risks, sea level rise risks. So there's very clear awareness within the services. Um, Congress, I think, can also act, um, obviously, by legislating, as it did on the Defense Authorization Bill. Um, it can also act in the, in the foreign relations committees um, looking at um, how we conduct uh, our overseas operations, um, how, what, what important issues we're looking at by holding hearings and also looking at um, authorization processes there. And then finally, most important, and I know John will love to talk about appropriations because at the end of the day, it's, it's all what what funds you appropriate. As you know, a strategy without money is hallucination. All right, I'll talk about appropriations a little bit. Um, <laughs> so I, I spent a long time as, as an appropriations staffer or a staffer for an appropriator uh, here on the Hill. And I, uh, and I still like him, even though I was an authorizer. <laughs> and, and, and I also got to be the deputy comptroller of DOD and, and sort of have, have my hands on the $600 billion budget. So, so uh, I think of most problems in, in terms of money. Um, so so uh, I'm going to splash a little bit of water here, no pun intended, and say um, Congress is probably not going to spend a lot of money on uh, the 100-year problem, the 30-year problem, or even the 10-year problem that we're facing. But they might very well spend some money on the problem, on the one-year problem or the two-year problem. Um, what, most staffers are going to, and, and they can tell me if I'm wrong, but most staffers are thinking about what bill they have to write this year. And uh, what am I going to put into the defense authorization? What, what is my boss going to ask for in the defense authorization bill this year? Or what is my boss going to ask for in the appropriations process this year? Um, and, and those things usually have to have some sort of a requirement already in place, or you're not going to get your money. So, um, so, so thinking about things in the immediate term, and the fact that uh, last year in the defense authorization bill, Congress directed the department to identify the 10 installations per service that are at the most risk uh, for climate change, I think a practical follow-on would be for Congress to require mitigation plans individual to each of the bases that DOD self-identifies um, uh, that they actually have to think through, all right, now what are you going to do about it? And to include it in the encroachment planning process that's already underway. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so this, um, this is a process which I, I think is, is immediate. There are other things. You have $10 billion of military construction you've requested. I think it is not unreasonable to require the department to think about whether they're putting those in floodplains or not, because frankly, your floodplains that you've already established and, and identified are not 100-year floodplains anymore, even if you call them 100-year floodplains. And so the fact that you should expect those buildings to flood. 
um, at some point t during the during the time that they they are there. So you should be thinking about that. Um, there, there are a whole host of things, but but they are sort of near term, immediate things that Congress is going to be looking at right now. I think it's probably a bridge too far to ask Congress to start spending money on the hundred year problem. Uh, this year because they'll say, well, I've got 100 years. Uh, somebody will think about that uh, after I'm out of Congress. And they're right. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I'm not saying that as a criticism. I'm saying that as a practical reality. And, 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 but, but the study and the assessment will help us. We have this responsibility to prepare. So the smarter we get, the better Congress can justify some of those expenditures. And so uh, it won't necessarily be the one or two year problem anymore if you know that inexorably you're going to have a problem in 10 years and now is the time to build the new pier or build the new building or move the, or fix the transportation line. What do you do when you can't drive into Norfolk anymore because it's flooded out three hours a day and that just happens to happen during rush hour? Um, well, you probably need a new road and you probably needed to have built it already. So, so, um, so think about that. Uh, those are the problems that Congress needs to be thinking about right now. Okay, I, I think John's comments are actually very, very illuminating that, you know, we're not going to think about these long-term issues, uh, and he's probably right. And when we had climate stability, you could get away with that. We can't. So the submariners, God love them, have a saying that the stupid shall be punished. Let's not be too stupid here, okay? Uh, the other thing John said, which I thought was really interesting, is he said, well, you know, it's one to two feet of sea level rise in 30 years. Think about that on a basis of eight inches of sea level rise in the past 100 years. And one to two feet is probably a mainline, somewhat conservative prediction. So that is three times the rate of change in one third the time. We're already on this acceleration. And trust me, 2018 pretty soon will seem like the good old days. So, so that's, that's coming in here. What can Congress do? Well, first, let me, let me just say I think Congress is the key, not the administrations, whomever it is. It's not the administration. It is the Congress that will either ensure we're prepared or not. I don't think the Pentagon will figure this out. Uh, and look at the Pentagon. I mean, big things, when we've changed the DOD, did they come from inside the building? Or did they come from the Congress? How do we fight joint? How did we integrate our force? Even nuclear power. It basically was the Congress that directed <laughs> the, the, uh, the executive branch and the, and the Pentagon to do these things. I think the Congress does have that longer view. They can think longer than the COCOMs, the combatant commanders. Uh, specific things can do, it was already mentioned, I think, by Sherry. In public hearings, ask the hard questions. Uh, we had a saying that, you know, when we did things, either the various war plans and we would do exercises and, of course, we would always win, you know, the thoughtful commanders would say, well, what did we ferry dust here? Oh, we pretended that nobody was going to shoot at our logistics ships. Well, you know, the adversary might. Uh, so ask those questions. For example, in the Arctic, if we're not thinking about building surface ships, Understand, it takes about 10 years from the time that lieutenant commander has a brilliant idea in the Pentagon to the time you actually start building. It takes another 10 years, roughly, to build out the class, and those ships last, on average, about 30 years. So although my, ma my major is not mathematics, 10 plus 10 plus 30 is 50, that takes us to, you know, the, the 2060s. And I'll tell you, the year 2060s, we are going to have ice-free conditions in the Arctic probably starting actually in about 10 to 20 years from now. So are we thinking about that? And the answer is not really. We're going to wait and then we're behind. China is not waiting. Russia is not waiting. So where are we going to be? So ask the hard questions. Uh, we've talked about, I'll talk about the science piece. One place Congress can be very, very helpful is taking a look at the National Academy of Science decadal uh, report on space, on remote sensing, and taking a very serious look at those, uh, at, at those requests. This is not in the defense budget. This is more on, on how science, it's on NASA, it's on NOAA, but that monitoring of our weather, of our climate, is absolutely critical so we make smart decisions. And, and taking, taking a look at those uh, programs uh, 
would be most useful, and there is an academy report out that just came out a couple months ago, I think would, uh, would, be, would be good. John's absolutely right. I can't think of anyone who made four stars advocating for bases and, and more money. So again, uh, somebody's going to need to think about that trillion dollar investment holistically. So between our senior civilians and between, uh, between Congress and the staffs, the senior staffs, in Congress, we can we can help ourselves here, but don't don't necessarily rely on the active duty military to really be able to think about it because it's not in our culture. You know, we want to we want shiny toys, we want ships and aircraft and and tanks. We don't really want to spend money on bases unless it's General Keys and the Air Force and golf courses. But apart from that, we don't we don't do that. I know that's that's not fair because. <laughs> Demoted, it's not fair. It it's not fair. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, the Air demoted. Force, frankly, quality of life on the Air Force bases is better. It just yeah, is. It is. Right, right. So, okay. All right. So that's, uh, the, we, we need help there. Monitoring uh, in, in how we monitor the weather and climate, ask the hard questions, and, and, and help the Pentagon put the money where they're going to need to do it, even though there may not be strong advocacy within within the building. Thanks very much. My turn. Okay. Um, I think to follow up on Dave's points, um, asking the hard questions means you're going to, ha Congress will have to be educated. So they're going to have to inform themselves and that's going to take a lot of work because as it turns out, not a lot of people know a lot about this, particularly as, as, as in regard to how this impacts military facilities. That's just a fact. As an operator, I didn't know anything about this. I knew that the base flooded. Um, and I knew uh, that in Hampton Roads, it's sort of interesting every time it rains, the whole place floods. So, but that's all I knew. I didn't understand why. I was too busy worried about my day job. And my day job was very busy, and everyone's is. And so there is not a, there is a short-term focus on a two-year tour that might turn into eight months. And, um, and that's the way it is. So you're not going to get the deep understanding in many cases, not all, but in many cases within the military. And, and to the point about uh, infrastructure, the Navy, um, we wish we had the Air Force's attention to infrastructure, General. So we really wish that because we don't. We like stuff, and that's where we put our focus. Um, I think Congress can help. Uh, it's very short-sighted, certainly by asking the hard questions. Also, um, by encouraging and really directing the uh, Department of Defense to to make this in federal agencies in general to make decisions. One of the things I pound on a lot is setting standards. Congress shouldn't set the standards. It'll take forever when they have to be changed and updated, but they should direct that the services set standards to which they will plan, and those standards must include projected flood mapping, as an example, and projected groundwater levels and projected aquifer levels and whatever the, the challenge is for the region of the base that's in, that you are dealing with. Um, that will help, in turn, the states and the local communities make decisions for themselves about what standards they need to apply. They'll understand what the federal entities are working towards, and then they can, I suspect, strongly, since as Admiral Parker and I were talking earlier, leadership tends to be a challenge in this area, um, that when the federal standards, or the Defense Department in particular standards are, are set, uh, that the states and the, and the local communities will fall in on that and use that as theirs, at, at least as a minimum, and that would be of, of value. Because if you're Naval Station Norfolk and you're surrounded by the city of Norfolk, you and the city of Norfolk's futures are inextricably linked. And really, if you're in Hampton Roads, all of the cities and Naval Station Norfolk's futures are inextricably linked. But they all want to argue about what should be the right thing. If, if a federal standard were in place, they'll follow that. Second, um, there needs to be more ways that federal, state, and local can partner, particularly in a fiscal capacity. So there must be some way, you know, Sykes Act is one way, REPI is another, Defense Road Access Program. How do we give more ways for cities and federal entities to collaborate directly and work out funding strategies that they can both share um, and plan towards and execute to get to this uh, my favorite example is Hampton Roads Boulevard, but um, to get federal accesses or things that impact the federal facilities that aren't in their fence line, um, support to 
be upgraded and maintained and, and to prepare for this challenge so that the federal facilities can continue to operate and the communities will benefit from that as well. So how can we inform and sh maybe improve that process of direct collaboration? And then I, I talked about projected um, processes earlier in floodplain mapping, but um, when you talk to the average military base commander, and I'll use the Navy as an example, and you say, you know, you need to look at long range floodplains because it, that's not only gonna tell you, it, flood doesn't just get higher, it also gets wider, so more of your facilities will be impacted. Most of them don't understand that, and that's because they've never had to deal with it. So you know, first understand what it is, and then insist that projected floodplains be used for facilities that are in a floodplain or parts of it are and how they're going to plan for their future because right now that's not being directed and FEMA doesn't do it unless they're asked to. So um, those those kind of three things. Um, and then I think the last piece I'd like to explain quickly, Hampton Roads Boulevard is a major artery that accesses Naval Station Norfolk. Hampton Roads Boulevard is floods routinely, but it does not flood near the fence line of Naval Station Norfolk. So it's an access road, but it's down the road where the challenges are. Uh, it also impedes the ability of vehicles to get into the Port of Virginia. We have no capacity to understand how that road flooding and being closed impacts the base or the port. We don't have any way to get data to say, do we, what happens to the traffic pattern when Hampton Roads Boulevard is closed? What happens to working hours to people's ability to do their jobs when Hampton Roads Boulevard closed. The port may have some ability to track that because they're su in such lockstep with all the containers that they're moving, fifth largest container port in the, in the United, United States right now, Norfolk, the four ports of Norfolk. Um, but we don't know what the impact is to the base when Hampton Roads Boulevard floods twice a day like it did in November of this past year for three or four days at a time and is shut down. You can't go that way, you have to go around. We have no way of tracking that. People ask me this on panels all the time. Well, how does the Navy know what's happening? We don't have a good way to keep, to understand that. We don't have a good way to assess that impact on our ability to do our job. So the selective vulnerability study is a start, but there's a whole lot more that needs to be done there. And, and I think as we start to understand that, we'll be able to prioritize what's critical and vulnerable and then start to work together to understand what actions need to be taken forward. So, thank you. Well, first of all, do what they said. Um, I think that's the most, that's, that's really important. Um, secondly, there are a lot of recommendations in this report, um, a lot of very specific recommendations um, for the administration, but a lot of those recommendations and a lot of what we're trying to get at with these uh, could use a lot of congressional support in different ways. And so I would say, you know, take a look at those. I'm biased, but there's good stuff in there. Um, the third thing is, I think, build on what has been said and done um, during this administration and this Congress. Um, it sounds like, a, might, for some, might sound like a strange thing to say, but we've had 12 senior defense leaders that I've counted since, um, since the inauguration in 2017 um, who've been pretty clear about um, climate change impacts on their mission. Uh, and have been pretty clear about some of the things that they're doing. So listen to what they're saying. And you know, we've heard Sherry and Ann and, and others talk about um, the recent hearing with the, vice, with the vice chiefs and the vice commandant. Listen to what they said. Uh, listen to the kinds of vulnerabilities they mentioned uh, and try to figure out how to, how to build on that. And, so, and also during this Congress, we have a 2018 NDAA uh, that, as others have mentioned, um, calls on the DOD to identify the top 10 vulnerable uh, military bases, uh, calls on the DOD to, you know, to, to conduct a study on, on, on risks to its mission, um, build on that um, after, you know, you know, and, 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 and gather that information and then, go, and then go from there. So, and that's just the DOD. But um, there's stuff happening right now. We've, the intelligence community, the worldwide threat assessment identifies climate change risks. Um, go to the intelligence community and ask them um, um, more questions about that and, uh, and then build on that intelligence uh, to figure out what you can do legislatively. Uh, the last thing is really not covered so much here, but I think elements in this report touch on it. If there's an infrastructure bill, think really hard about what was said uh, here this morning and during this panel. Uh, think really hard about what you know, senior leaders are saying from DOD, from the intelligence community um, about, about climate and infrastructure. 
um, and from DHS and the Coast Guard. So um, if you're going to do a real infrastructure bill, if you're going to do you know, good investments in infrastructure for this country going forward, uh, then if this issue isn't a part of that discussion, um, then that's not good for homeland or national security. And so I think if there's going to be something like that this year or, or later, um, think pretty hard about um, some of the issues raised today. Thank you. Um, let's see. I think I saw some hands back here. Uh, we have a roving mic, and we probably have time for about one or two, one or two quick questions. Thank you. Uh, really, really insightful comments. Um, if, in fact, this is an existential threat, unprecedented threat, um, most of the discussion has been focused on adaptation, very critical to mitigate the kind of traditional national security missions that we've thought of. But if it is, in fact, existential, um, they're not sufficient to protect the American people from the threat itself. So um, I think I'd like the views of the panel on DOD's untapped potential. And when I say DOD, I also mean Congress, which authorizes and appropriates DOD. Um, you know, as the nation's third largest landholder, second largest if you count in all the repi um, boundary areas, um, the biggest budget of any entity in the world, the biggest R&D budget of any ent entity in the world, the biggest energy user, the biggest owner of buildings. Um, is there more that DOD can do um, on the reversing the trajectory of climate change side of things? Um, is there a responsibility to repair, also a responsibility to protect the American people by doing what we can to lessen the threat? Um, I mean, most importantly, DOD has the trust of the American people, year after year, the most trusted institution. So not only can we do concrete things on all the assets we own, but we can be a leader, not only uh, in the US, but also with all of our partners around the world who often happen to be the biggest landholders in their countries also. And I'm talking about vegetation, soils, waters, all the things that we could do as far as reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Thanks. And let's uh, bundle two questions together. Is there, I think there was one over. <laughs> I'm, I'm cheating because I <laughs> work with and, and admire all these people. Um, I, we've talked a lot about DOD, and I, I recognize that's your backgrounds, but I'm wondering where there's a civ mill connection or what the militaries can do in terms of diplomacy and, and kind of bridging those gaps. Okay, thank you. Great questions. Well, uh, Steve. You know, if, if um, I, I agree with the facts you laid out there, and we've seen the Department of Defense go from being an environmental laggard in the 60s and 70s and earlier to being seen as an environmental and clean energy leader today. And we've also seen that the Defense Department, the, military, the United States military has been at the forefront of many waves of different types of change from racial integration um, to others, um, to adapting new technologies. And so I think the US military is already beginning to lead here, but there's a lot more that of course we could do. And I'm glad you're there helping push that leadership. Um, and I think modeling what we can do in working with partner nations around the world, I think is increasingly important for the COCOMs to be seized with this and um, for this to be integrated across our foreign policy and national security engagement strategies globally. And that really goes to, to uh, Caitlin's question about the, the CIF mill integration because we don't operate around the world in stovepipes. We, we do integrate the civilian capacity. Um, not only across command, combatant commands like AFRICOM, but we, we should always do this in our foreign policy when we're engaging uh, with other nations. And we've seen now increasingly, uh, as we work with our European allies, for example, that they have, you know, their balance integrates well the diplomacy and the development uh, with the defense. And we need to think of these as sort of combined assets of national power. Um, instead of separate ones, and we need to think of our climate and energy assets as elements of our national power, too. It's very clear that China gets it. 
and has integrated its and its even its green energy opportunities as an element of its own national power as it puts forward its its um, uh, foreign policy uh, strategies and and Russia in its own inimical way. <laughs> But we, we need the um, America can do it, and uh, we should be integrating both for the homeland security and national security. Okay, so I'm going to be careful. Oh. I'm going to jump in here. I was on the other panel, but I have significant scar tissue over this issue. Uh, the first issue, first one thing is when we talk about uh, DOD, you got to look at the throw weight, the market throw weight that DOD has particularly in the energy area. People will say, well, they use the most energy, the single single largest user of energy in the United States, but they only use 1.7% of the energy budget in the United States. So it's one of those play on words. You don't have to use that much if you just say DOD, so 1.7%. That means if DOD goes out of business tomorrow, it doesn't improve our green standing. It's, it's going to be a blip on the big graph of where we are on uh, stopping global warming. Now, having said that, I just say that's important to, because if you're only pulling the amount of oil of about two medium-sized oil wells down in the Gulf per day, that pales in comparison to what we're burning here in the, in the United States. So we need to be careful about that. Second thing is, when I send America's sons and daughters downrange, I expect him to be the best trained, the best led, and the best equipped force that I can. So when I'm doing things, I'm going to do things that focus on mission effectiveness. When I send the Marines down and they're humping a 180-pound pack, I'm going to be real caught up with <clears throat> renewable energy, that they can put a solar device on their backpack and they can recharge the batteries so they, so they <clears throat> are not throwing away 1,000 AA batteries uh, as they're out there on, on patrol. Uh, if it's a problem with a small... Uh, outpost out there. I'm going to do everything I can to bring solar and wind and trash to energy, those technologies, because that prevents me from having to take liquid fuel across Indian country 500 miles and gets people killed and, and seriously wounded. So that the focus on the DOD is looking at is, one, how do I make my bases resilient, which means if the grid goes down for even a short period of time, how do I operate my how do I operate my bases so I can mobilize and deploy and reach back? Technology for that, I'm going to be in there, and I'm going to be putting money uh, in. But those things that don't have a direct application to mission effectiveness and keeping my people safe, then I think it's a matter of we have a Department of Energy, lamentably more focused on the Department of Nuclear Energy. But we have a DOE. We've got a lot of departments that should, that when we talk a whole of government, when we say the whole of government, then we start talking about DOD. There's a lot more people out there besides uh, DOD. So I think that in this discussion, I would just like everyone to, let's make sure we know exactly uh, what we're talking about, what we want DOD to do, and uh, what we want the rest of our government to do. And then Another comment I can't help but make, but when we talk about Congress, Congress can help, but what we don't need are rules that say we can't talk about it, rules that say we can't prepare for climate change. That is not helpful. You need DOD to be good stewards of the people and the equipment they have, and we don't want to write into law that you cannot assess or you cannot spend money to make your base resilient. I mean, that would be my... <clears throat> on my Christmas wish list when I talk, when I talk about uh, NDAAs and things like that. We've changed that a little bit, but there were not so many years ago there was money being cut from the budget because it had climate change in the, in the budget request. Not, that's not the way to run a, a railroad through, a, through high water. So I apologize for jumping in, but I, I feel, uh, feel like I've lived this... Uh, through the last part of my uh, active duty career, and I just think we need to keep focused on what we need to keep focused on. I think it's, wasn't it Covey that said the main thing is keeping the main thing the main thing? And I think that's what we need to keep focused on. So I could probably talk for 10 minutes, but we're running out of time, and uh, I can talk to you afterwards, but General Keyes basically said all the cynical things that I was gonna say, um, and, and, and we can talk more about all this stuff later. Heather, do we need to, to go to wrap up soon? Just 
yeah, kind of what the general said. Uh, where, where I think the DOD can be very helpful is in the interagency process. It is the 800-pound gorilla. It can help advocate for the right agencies. You know, there, there is always this temptation to make every problem a DOD problem. The DOD isn't looking to be the every problem solver. So have the Department of Energy, have NASA, have everybody else do their job and fund them for it. Fund them adequately to do that. So I think that can be really helpful. On the Civ Mill, Caitlin's question, Admiral Greenert, when he was Chief of Naval Operations, uh, there's a every other year uh, Sea Power Symposium we run up at Newport. Uh, we invite basically every head of Navy that will talk to the US uh, to come. Uh, and there's only about three days of actual work in there. Admiral Greenert devoted one half of one day and asked me to lead a uh, maritime risk of climate change uh, symposium, and we engaged basically every Navy that would talk to us, and I think that's, uh, that's an effective thing to do. Thanks. The civ mill, there's a civ mill dimension just here within the United States as well, and there hasn't been a lot of cooperation between, say, political military affairs at state and DOD on how to deal with this, with climate change, not even under the last administration. So, um, so I just suggest, you know, looking at ways that we can, you can drive more collaboration between state and DOD, you know, through those mechanisms to figure out, you know, to, 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 which gets to, I think, General Keyes' you know, point about whole of government. There, there are things that can be done collaboratively with other agencies that, um, that we've been missing. Thank you, um, and thank you for, for all of your remarks. I just want to invite um, Laura Iglitzen from the H.M. Jackson Foundation, who helped um, sponsor the event up quickly to make some closing remarks um, and uh, to thank them for, oh. for their efforts. Thanks. Well, does this work? Uh, first, thanks to the panel. Let's give them a round of applause. So it's always nice to be thanked uh, as, as a supporter. Um, people abbreviate H.M. Jackson Foundation. It's the uh, Henry M. Jackson Foundation, named after um, former Senator Scoop Jackson. So for those of us uh, old enough to know who he was, the reason that we are here today with our partners, EESI and the Center for Climate Security and the David Rockefeller Fund to hear these two important panels is really because Senator Jackson was a long-term thinker. He was someone who thought ahead. And he was also deeply committed to issues on the environment, on environmental security, on national security, and also of our military and our military bases. So uh, as one of our uh, members of our board likes to say, this is squarely within Senator Jackson's wheelhouse. And uh, so I think we heard today specifically the kind of long-term thinking and, and big picture strategic thinking that is really critical and, and something that Senator Jackson and certainly we appreciate. And I, I just pull out a few, you know, final quotes. I mean, the unspeakable will happen even if you don't speak about it. And it's not just over there. It's here. It's happening now. Uh, we are a nation of action. It's up to us to prepare. While we don't know everything, we know a lot. We're either going to react or we're going to anticipate. And finally, we are in a climate era. So I think there were uh, so many pithy comments said today um, and really important strategic thoughts that um, I really appreciated hearing from both panels. And thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>